Here we go. I'm hitting the button. I'm clicking the button. It's on. Okay. JJ Cassetta, my All man. Right. Corley Moore, Firehouse right. Vigilance. I got to close this door. <laughs> Minor technical difficulties as we get going. Weekly scrap number 195. My guest tonight is the one and only JJ Cassetta. He is a 27 year career firefighter currently serving as a lieutenant with the city of Orlando fire department, where he has been for the past 20 years. Prior to that, he was a firefighter with the city of Cincinnati fire department. He has the degree. He has the certs. He has been involved with the Orlando fire conference for over 20 years. He started out as an instructor now on the OFC board of directors. He has been an instructor at conferences everywhere from local to state to national, all the way up to hot instructor at FDIC. He is passionate about the fire service his family, and fire photography. He's an enthusiastic fire buff and loves traveling, teaching, learning about the job. JJ Cassetta, it is my honor to call you a friend and it is a pleasure to have you on as the guest of Weekly Scrap number 195. Welcome, my brother. Thank you very much. Glad to be here, man. It's uh, been a long time coming. You asked me a bunch of times to come on the show and I think, well, man, why do you want me to come on the show? What, what do you want me for? But here I am. I finally, I finally relented. And uh, I'm happy to be here, you know, as like the third stringer uh, from the Orlando Fire Department after you had uh, Walt Lewis and, and Basil Ibrahim on. So uh, whatever. I'm here, though. Very, very good company. And yeah. brother, I'm super stoked for tonight's exciting uh, scrap. So absolutely. And, and the number one thing I get every time I ask anybody to be on the scrap is, why do you want me? Like every time. And that's the that's the quality of the humility of the of the people that come on. So I thank you for that. I really do. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, anything I missed in the intro? Anything you want to add? I don't think so. That that that's it, man. I I just I love the job. But, you know, a lot of people like how how can you been doing this job for so long? You look so so. Yeah, I'm just not not being cocky. I look a little bit young. I don't have much gray hair yet, luckily for whatever reason. But I'm gonna be 50 this year. So I uh, I started young, man. I've actually been riding fire trucks since I was about 16 years old uh, as an explorer uh, in the suburban fire department here in Orlando. Uh, outside of Orlando, I started and. Uh, been doing it ever since man and, and you know i don't know where like how everybody got their starts like is that one of the things you ask a lot of people like everybody asks like hey how'd you get your start in the fire service or you know what got you into the fire service and for me it, it goes back to like seventh grade man and i was born and raised in houston and we had career day in middle school and who knows how many different people came in but man when the when the Firefighter was up there and he got done talking. I knew then and it was there, over. It was over. I, was do, man. <laughs> I love it, man. Okay. I'm going to catch you up on what people are saying already. Uh, Sam, the producer says better late than never. We had some technical <laughs> difficulties getting it going, but we are live. Uh, Dennis Riley said, what's up, men? Top notch stuff tonight. John McCoy said pumped up for those cassetta nuggets tonight. Uh, <laughs> What's up, fellas from Eric Morgan? James Michalisco says, three bugled firefighter checking in from Indy, repping Pike Township Fire Department. Fast Wrench says, third stringer, more like cleanup hitter. So I like that <laughs> one. There you go. Uh, Dave, Dave t told me, he said he was going to be one of the sponsors tonight. So, you know, he picked it out out of the groups. He said, yes, I want JJ. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah. JJ is an amazing instructor and a great person. I'm a better firefighter because of him and the men of VG Bowling Green, which I think we're going to talk about. Uh, that's from Danny. And it scrolled. I'm sorry, Danny. Sorry, Danny. Danny it went away. <laughs> Wilbert Kurt Isaacson said, again, I'm trying to keep up. My buddy with an exclamation point. Dennis Riley said, 50, you're just a child. <laughs> All right. So, so tons of people checking in. Uh, Danny Stelter. I, I, I feel like a kid in the fire service. Stelter, sometimes. Stelter. I had to get Danny. Yeah, Danny right. Stelter. What a, that that guy's a a gentleman and a scholar, man. Love that guy. And he also wants to know what product do you use for your hair. <laughs> he knows exactly what I use. Fair enough. All right, here we go. We'll do this part. Uh, if you want to be a member of the exclusive Cool Kids Club, join the Vigilantes. Exclusive swag, exclusive discounts, exclusive monthly for, monthly forums. Uh, we have a forum coming up one week from today on June 11th. We're going to talk about the wall bombs fire. Rob Fisher's coming in to talk about building construction and what happened at the wall bombs fire and break it down. It's going to be exciting. If you want to be a part of that, go to firehousevigilance.com, sign up, five bucks a month. It's an amazing, amazing thing to be a part of. Plus, you get to pick things like, what are we going to call the next, next five questions for firefighters? And what are they going to be? So you're going to be involved in all that as well as who gets to be guests and and just 
impact the scrap. So go be a part. Now, on to the sponsors. Uh, the OG sponsor of the scrap, Key Hose. Check them out on Facebook. The Hose Experts. Affordable Drill Towers. Home of the Affordable Drill Tower and the Affordable Standpipe Prop. Firefighter. Owned and operated. Pump and roll using the Affordable Standpipe Prop. The Affordable Standpipe Prop fits through most classroom doorways for standpipe theory, and then you roll it into the parking lot where you can actually pump to it. It comes with six standpipe valves that can be upgraded to PRVs or customized to what you have in your jurisdiction. Call Steve, 844-55-TOWER, or drop an email to info at affordabledrilltowers.com. Next up, Fire Station Furniture, firestationfurniture.com. They provide a complete line of quality furniture for your firehouse. Firefighter owned and operated, they understand the strain. And believe me, if you have a day room with recliners, you know what I'm talking about. The strain that firefighters can put on furniture, and they offer furniture that's built to last. Visit firestationfurniture.com for more information. And finally, we've already talked about Dave and the Fast Wrench. He said, I want, I want to sponsor JJ tonight. And I'm like, absolutely. The Fast Wrench is the one and only standpipe operations multi-tool in the fire service. It combines 10 different tools into one lightweight, easy-to-use hand tool. The Fast Wrench is quickly becoming the best practice tool for adjusting any make or model field adjustable PRV. And it is an absolute must-have in your standpipe kit. Designed by a firefighter for doing the tough business of standpipe firefighting. Lighten your kit and streamline your operations with the Fast Wrench. Check them out at fastwrench.net. There you go. Four for four. Very excited. Now we get on to the business of the scrap. JJ, man, I always send out an email and say, hey, what do you want to talk about? What can I research? What are good topics for me to, to research and have good questions for you? And I'm not going to lie. When, he, when, when JJ sent back his list, it is the most comprehensive list I think has ever been sent to me by a guest. And so I don't, I'm not sure exactly where to start. Which part do you want to touch on first? Well, you know what? I, I just, I want to talk about uh, mentors real quick because everybody kind of talks about that and, and, and people that have them. And, and I just want to, you know, like this and, you know, I'm just steal something from, from Kurt Isaacson about, we are the lucky ones. You know, I feel more than lucky to have been in this profession for as long as I have and still love it and still have the passion for the job. And, you know, you come across so many different people and I, and I've had experiences in three different fire departments um, and, and come across people and not all my friends, you know, like, just like Kurt will tell you and a bunch of guys say, it's, it's not all your best friends work with you. You know, you don't always have that luck. So we're, you know, I run into Corley Moore, you know, in Pensacola or whatever, but we don't get to like chat and see each other in the firehouse all the time. And, you know, there's just so many great guys in the fire service, but I really want to just mention like, Every once in a while, man, you come across somebody that you just boom, you know they're it for you. You know, it's 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 just kind of a connection, not not in a uh, you know, not in a 2023 way, just it's it's there, it's it's a you know, a connection and I call them bromates, bromates yeah, or bromance. Well, that it's a bromance, yeah. right? Right. So I always like have a tech group text with some of my guys, you know, we we want to share some uh brotherhood, bromance, and buffing, right? Because I'm I'm a fire bus, so we gotta go there. But um first and foremost was was a guy that I met uh, when I worked for the city of Altamont Springs, which was the first fire department I started with. Uh, we were both, you know, super young guys. Um, and his name's Matt Negley. And uh, he was my best friend for 16 years, man. From like day one, we, we hit it off. And you just knew, man, he, that guy had, talk about passion for the fire service and a natural born leader and, you know, a phenomenal dude. And I've taken more trips to go to classes we've been to fdtn together buff trips trips in general with our you know significant others and, and going places and you know unfortunately you know he's no longer with us you know he, he died uh november 29 2016 from suicide and you know i i, I do it, it's tough sometimes to talk about but i do want to say it because it's you know nowadays it's a big deal man um it's something that's affecting the fire service you know just as much as anything else and and you know that whole stigma behind it is is pretty tough to deal with and it, right. it was a blow to me man I, I will tell you you know people talk about you know um you know having that light or you know the candle burning or whatever for your passion and, and i would certainly say i'm still passionate and i still love the job but you know I, I don't know that my torch glows quite as bright as it did you know prior to that day you know it was it was a, it was a big loss for me to have to have that 
you know, just a, a guy who was on my job and, and loved it just as much, if not more than I did. And, and we talked together and did stuff. And it was cool because we had that connection for the job. You know, I still have other great friends too, but they're just not on the job with me. Does that make sense? You know, oh, absolutely. In Orlando. So, so they understand some of the problems and listen, you know, it's the whole saying is same circus, different clowns, man. You know, the fire departments, the fire department, fire service across the nation, you know, we have some, some differences, but at the end of the day, it, it's almost the same thing, you know? Absolutely. So, um, oh, the mentors, mentors, go ahead, go ahead. No, that, that's, that's it about that one. And then, uh, you know, so that was like, that was in the early nineties, early to mid nineties. And we, and we, we did stuff. So one year he and I are at a FDIC and, uh, we were bus monitors, believe it or not, you know, uh, right. Way back in the day when when all the classes were out at, at uh, Clearstream, this is back in like 2000. I was working in Cincinnati. Uh, I, I had moved on from from the city was called City of Altamont Springs, a little suburban department. Matt had moved on to Orlando. We hooked up, um, you know, at FDIC with a bunch of guys, and we're like, ah, we, you know, bus monitors, and like the we were late to the game or whatever for for signing up to be a bus monitor. And the last class that they're like, hey, uh, you guys are gonna be the bus monitors for the uh, ground ladders class. So I'm like, all right, well, whatever. Now we go out there and, and lo and behold, man, it was a four hour class. And after those four hours, we did our thing. And, and, uh, he and I just kind of like looked at each other, like, man, we were blown away, like how much we learned, you know, in that class. <clears throat> so I'm sure a lot of people out here know what I'm about to say next. Um, Mike Champo, you know, right he on. was the lead instructor for that class and, you know, speaking of class, class act all the way, you know, here we were two young firefighters in our early twenties and we, we took this class and, and this guy just took us under his wing and, you know, the, all the guys, not just him, the guys that, that were teaching the class with him, Dana Hannon, you know, unfortunately another great, great guy that was killed in nine 11, uh, was one of the instructors, Walt Webb from DC, Matt Rush, uh, from Austin, Texas, Bob Swick from Fairborn, Ohio, and uh, Mike Shunk was another guy from uh, FDNY from Rescue One. And th those guys were just aces, man. And, you know, it, it just 20, you know, 23 years later, here we are, um, you know, and, and I don't say this to to brag or do any of that. Like, you know, Mike's one of my closest friends. We, right we on. you know, a couple times a week, we text almost every day. And he's just a phenomenal fireman, a phenomenal instructor, just a great all around guy. And I know just about everybody, you know, knows and mentioned, it's just, it's amazing, you know, that those relationships that you have and guys, and I just go back and I think that set the tone for me in the firehouse to, you know, welcome people and embrace people. Cause it, it just, it kind of doesn't get you angry sometimes when you, when guys feel like they don't have time for a visitor at the firehouse, right on whatever. So no, absolutely. You know, I don't want to keep just talking, 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 but no, no. Do you ever find yourself? Cause this is something I find myself saying is like, Holy crap. How did I end up in this circle talking to this person? And you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, I, I shouldn't be here right now. I'm an right. imposter. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does that make any yeah. sense? hundred percent. Like that. Yeah. It's like, like, why am I here? Why am I on the scrap? Right? Like, and there's some uh, of the greatest human beings ever, you know, and just so humble and, and they give and they give and they give. And that's him too. Humble, you know, 1000% yeah. man. And, you know, I, yeah, just, you know, I just like, like a quick story. Like when I was in Cincinnati and I was at the firehouse, I was assigned to truck 29. It was a great place, a bunch of senior guys. And I learned a ton there, but you know, we, we had a visitor from Dayton, Ohio there. It was a, a Lieutenant that came from their training division and they came cause we were, uh, our firehouse was attached to the uh, training Academy. And that was like lunchtime, but I got up, man. And I walked this guy around and showed him the rigs and, and, and just, you know, made a connection a little bit or whatever. And, you know, that was it, you know, I was just doing what I thought was the right thing to do. And lo and behold, like some months later, I'm up in Dayton and I'm uh, getting invited to teach at Sinclair Community College with some guys. And one of the times I'm, I'm teaching, we're doing some, some live burns and here comes this guy from Dayton. And he's like, Hey man, I remember you, you know, it was just like, you know, you do the right thing. And then it, it comes back to, you know, get you right off. The right the right it's like doing the right thing just because it's the right thing to do not because you have yeah. to or whatever. no no ulterior motives and it pays off dividends man so that's why you know just i remember i'll never forget that and it just like that's why i feel like i always want to make time for when somebody comes to you know stop by the firehouse or whatever and and you know like i said the 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 back to the 
the Houston thing, you know, I, I rode my bike to this firehouse that was closest to my house when I was a kid, you know, engine 69. And those guys just welcomed this kid from the neighborhood with open arms. And, and, you know, so I feel like when guys don't, don't do that to kids or, you know, and, and again, it's just another one of those things that, that Mike Champo is like super good at doing right on, right on. Yeah, now, I, 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 I want to dig in a little yeah. bit, too, because I, I have the term, you know, soulmate. Amanda's my soulmate. Soulmate. You know, that's a term most people know and get. Bromate, and you use the term bromance, but kind of the same thing. A bromate is someone you just have that connection with. Mm -hmm. So you've already mentioned, too. Go on. I want to finish this conversation. Yeah. Because uh, yep. so, Wilbur, Kurt Isaacson, he's in Facebook, and that's one of the people I want to talk about. All right. Go ahead. Well, so <laughs> you preempted me. So back in 2008 – doing the Orlando Fire Conference, uh, Matt says, hey, man, there's this guy from Pensacola that does this class called Gallons Per Second. I want to I wanna invite him down. So here's 2008. Kurt comes to his first Orlando Fire Conference to teach, and we're at a uh, barbecue restaurant having dinner, and we strike up a conversation. And again, like almost immediately, you know, I knew like this was, we, we connected on that level and this was going to be a guy that I wanted to hang out with and be around. I mean, you know, we're talking 15 years ago now and look at all the stuff that he's done Oh yeah. So, since then. And I kind of feel like, oh man, I got it on the ground level, you know, here's this like genuine dude with passion and uh, you know, the trips that we took too. So I think later that year, he went to Detroit with us. I think, you know, it was either that year or the, the next year that he took one of the trips and we just, me and him and Matt had some phenomenal you know, times I even got Mike Champo to go buffing with us there at the trip <laughs> a couple times. So he's he's a buff too, even though he might not act like it. He's a buff. He told me he's listening in unless a second alarm comes in, then he's going to be buffing that. He said, "Right on, right on, beautiful." Final one. I, go ahead. I don't. I don't know when you're oh, going to that, cut that, off. That, that, so he's the guy. You know, that's it. He. You know, I know he's mentioned me about being his bromance. He called. You know, go to his house every summer, and we we bring the family up to. Uh, what was water on the fire every August? What a you know awesome time that is, and and it's just you know great dude. And we're gonna be doing some more traveling together, me and him, and and Mike, hopefully sometime down the road. But uh, yeah, man, it's just I've I've been up there riding with him a bunch and learned a whole bunch from him and taking some pictures and maybe we'll take a look at one or two of those later on. But uh, right on, yeah. So you know, but there's a, there's a ton of mentors out there for everybody, and you know from the some of the big names and and. and guy and it's just funny because i i you always be like man there's no way that that guy would like talk to me you know right. and sure enough like i mean i i consider a lot of these guys my friends i would say you know guys like uh you know mike lombardo jim mccormick you know bob morris i've got to help teach you know some force country stuff it's unbelievable these guys are phenomenal dudes and i feel like guys like like bob who have been teaching for so long, like that's the, you know, we just talk about like the social media aspect of things like that guy has been in it for the long haul, like way before social media was a thing, you know? And, and I guess that's like a thing about me that I, that I was like, ah, why do you want me to be there? Like, I don't, I'm not a social media guy, you right. know, I have my Instagram account, but I don't really, you know, do the whole Facebook thing much. I have it. And, and again, you know, it just kind of goes back to a certain time when I just kind of like shut it down. And which I didn't even know you were fire department shutterbug for quite some time. I didn't know that was, I knew JJ Cassetta. I didn't know that you were fired up by yeah. Shutterbug. Yeah. I don't mean to blow your cover here on the scrap. Oh, that's but... right. Oh, no. No, <laughs> but... please. I need, I need some, I need some followers every now right, and then. There, there you go. But no, I, I, again, because like you said, you're not big on just trying to get likes and shares and stuff. You just, yeah, very low key. But go ahead. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that, that, that's it. So, you know, just, there's just so many awesome, you know, guys. And even, you know, if I could throw some names out there of, of, People, that people wouldn't know, but they're still phenomenal firefighters, phenomenal instructors, you know, some guys in my first fire department who just, you know, as an explorer, like took me under their wing and I learned so much from it. It's a, like mentorship is a big deal. You know, we just talk about, you know, I think we'll kind of touch on it a little later, just about, you know, when, when, when guys come into the fire service, you know, the whole thing now is like, oh, these guys don't like the job or they don't know the job or they don't, you know, have a trade or they don't do this. But, you know, you have to, rather than like be their critic, man, you have to like, you know, pump them up. You got to get them to where you want them to be. And I, and that's something I learned at my, at my last firehouse with, with my, uh, my crew was like, you, you can't go out there and, and have a guy throw ladders and do VES and, and go, man, well, he sucked. Well, right. he hasn't done it yet. You know, he hasn't, he hasn't, doesn't have the experience that, that a 
12 or 15 year guy has, or even an eight year guy has, like you have to give that guy the benefit of the doubt. As long as he's putting in the effort and willing to put in the work and wanting to do it and wanting to get better, then you have to be positive about it, you know, and, and understand like, Hey man, we didn't all walk. Like I, I learned to this day when I got out of the fire Academy and I thought I knew what being a fireman was all about, you know, Whoa, I was sorely mistaken. Right. You don't know that you don't know what you don't know. Right. Now I'm like, Holy, you know, there's, there's, we don't teach guys in the state of Florida. I hate to say it to be firefighters. We, you know, we, we teach the curriculum that the state fire Academy, the state fire college gives us. And they're so antiquated and so far behind that, that you, you guys have to get on the job and learn the job. And that's not unique to your state at all. I mean, that's, that's a endemic endemic of the entire nation. And so we're teaching books instead of real world and the, and the books can't keep up with the real world and the data and the science. And that's just facts. And so I don't have a good answer for it, but it's a recurring theme throughout many, many scraps, but absolutely. It's not unique to that. Uh, no, I love it, man. I love the, I love your acknowledgement of mentors. Oh, speak, speaking of, I asked you the question and, and, and it threw you for a loop earlier. If I could mention my sponsors, we kind of got off going and it's, it's just kind of a, you know, a thing, but I, right. I appreciate Dave being the, the, uh, the fast wrench sponsor for me, but am I allowed to say anything about being sponsored? No, you're gonna, it's, it's, it's a scrap. It's live. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm sponsored by, uh, Sutphin because my fire department is all Sutphin apparatus in case anybody didn't know, that's all we have from you know engines trucks heavy rescue now the only thing i'll say is if you piss off my sponsors then i don't know what i'm going to do but go ahead uh, you they're not really my sponsors i'm just saying that just, <laughs> just for the heck of it. i like um, it i'm just go um, ahead. Uh, on uh facebook and instagram training seconds i'm sure you've heard of training oh, seconds yeah. you haven't look them up training seconds and uh this is just kind of an inside joke but uh schmidt's beer is uh as as a sponsor of mine. So. Schmidix, am I saying it right? It's, yeah, Smithix. Yeah, it's not okay. It's not Smithwix as it looks like it's, but it's uh, Schmidix. Yeah, Schmidix. Yep, Schmidix. All right, I don't get the inside joke, but I'll run with oh, it. Sponsored right. by Schmidix beer. Yeah. There you go. And training <laughs> really seconds. So much, what's training that? seconds. And we need to get training seconds and the beautiful mustache on here on the scrap. You, Absolutely. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um. Okay. So where are we at? I don't know where we're at on the notes. I'm trying to pull up the notes. Okay. I was just going through some mentors and I was just, since we're going to talk about photography real quick, I'll just, I'll just go down and. Are you uh, ready to see some pictures? No, but no, okay. uh, I okay. just wanted to, to just talk about uh, just a couple uh photographer uh, photography mentors too, real quick. Okay. Since, since we're on that. Um, so, you know, speaking of, again, of guys that you're like, there's no way this guy is even going to talk to me. Um, so just, you know, kind of a quick story because it's kind of funny. Like back in the the '90s, there was a, a fire truck calendar, right? So this is kind of my like the fire buff coming out of me. Um, that was put out uh, like a fire ground action calendar by uh, Bob Pressler, actually, again, and uh, John Citrino from Boston, and uh, that that sparked my interest kind of back then. And uh, you know, it took me probably ten years to come around to really, uh, you know, get into fire photography. But uh, th those those two guys and John you know, he, he's a very humble, quiet kind of guy too. He's a, you know, Irish and he's got that dry sense of humor. Uh, he's been on the Boston Fire Department over 30 years now, uh, but a phenomenal photographer. Um, and we've taken some trips together too. And he's taught me a ton. And, you know, he, he's a, he's a critic. I'll send him photos all the time. And he's like, well, what's wrong with this picture? You know, he's just like blowing it up. I'm like, man, it's, it looks, I thought it was great, but right. You know, which is obviously what you need, right? You can't, you know, every every you, you can't fix what's, what what no one critiques. Yeah. So, anyway, all right. That that that's it. There, you know, him, uh, Bob Pressler, Tim Klett, those those guys are are uh, great. Bill Noonan, who I, I've met one time, he was a the, you know Boston photographer who who wrote a, you know made a bunch of books. I didn't even know Timmy Klett was a was a photographer. Like I had but, him on the scrap. I don't even think we talked about his photography at all. Yeah. Well, he he. Well, I'll have to. Don't let the secret out. Don't tell him I, I said it, but he, he's you building. An, another guy. And I, I just quick, quick story. And then, then we can move on. Sorry. Um, the first time I took Matt to Detroit, uh, back in 2008, Bob and Tim happened to be there at the same time. We didn't know it. You know, we kind of knew them, didn't really know, but, um, found out that we, they were going to be there and Matt and I were just driving along and we were going to see, um, engine 23 squad three's firehouse. It's this cool old 1800s, late 1800s firehouse on West Grand Boulevard. And, uh, Man, lo and behold, no, no kidding. Like we see a header, like in in the sky. So <laughs> we're, 
we 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 head to it we're like you know we're there right they haven't even put out the box yet we're there and we actually called it in and then we called bob and tim to tell them and when they got there they were like hey listen next time call us first then call it in because we were just past the exit and then we had to go up and turn around they got there like a little late so it was like you know like a big right right absolutely but uh it was uh it was cool so anyway that's it that's that's where we're at so i think you might be the first admitted but i mean obviously there's a lot of buffs that have been on but you're the one who who revels in the buffery and talks <laughs> about the and the mentors of the buffer i can't hide it man you know what it's it's funny that you say that because i didn't always you know what like and it's one of those things of you know guys on my job when i when, when we first started taking these trips were like what what are you what are you doing why why would you do that like they're like mad about it like there was even like, and I, you know, I have to be careful what I say because I don't. Some guys could like know that I'm calling him out, but like, there was a guy that was like, just on me about it. We worked in the same firehouse, and I was like, "Hey, man, I saw some pictures of you like up in New York City and Rescue One, you know, back like early in your career in the '90s when these guys were like, you know, what bunch of guys went up there and rode and stuff." And I'm like, "You did the same thing, you know, 20, 20 years ago. So what's the difference?" You know, but as you know, them out. now they're too cool for it or whatever. Like, like, you know, everybody's like Kurt says, too cool for school, right? Like, but you know what, man? If if you want to go freeze your tail off and sit in a deer stand and wait for a deer, you you, you hunt deer. If you want to go out and, and go fishing and do all that, that's great. I, I just say I go hunting for fires, man. That's what I do, you know. Like it's just it's not about that too. Like the photography's great, but man, just some of the best times you have with some with your bromances, right? You know? Hanging out, cruising around, talking. Dude, I'm jealous of the 2008 trip. Holy crap! Every all the, just the names involved in that was amazing. <laughs> so, uh, no, awesome. Yeah, okay. Just to be clear, like they, Bob and Tim weren't with us. We just happened to be there at the same time. But I mean, it, you know, we definitely, you know, those guys are, are great dudes. And and cause I tell you, man, you you, you know, you can definitely know that, that that Bob Presser's old school because like before all the technology, man. As much as he probably like knew the streets of his first run in in New York City, that guy knows the city of Detroit. You know, oh, wow. all right. like the back of his hand. So, are you going to teach a, a buffing class? Is that the next class you're going to teach? Hands on buffing 101? <laughs> uh, that comes from who said it? I was trying to see. Wilbur Kurt Isaacson, or Bo Smith said, Wilbur Kurt Isaacson, we having a buffing 101 class at Urban to Suburban in August. I need trained up. A lot, yeah. a, a we lot we of can do that. We can do that at the bar over some Smittics. There we go. There we go. And a bunch of people saying, I'm in. I'm in. Joe Driver is the chauffeur. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> beautiful i love it okay where are we at uh fire photography social media do you want to uh, this is my first topic i had written down okay yeah well we can we can we can you want to dive into photos or do you want to just talk okay. about social media which one which way you want to go with it uh yeah let's talk about the social media aspect whatever like i said i'm not a big social media guy and you know it's a blessing and a curse right like so we're here doing facebook live you're you know we had a little technical difficulties in the beginning but you know you're in oklahoma and i don't know where where the other guy is but is he is he like your your he's he's the producer he's in oklahoma here also but his okay, right. internet so, is more yeah, stable okay. than than mine is if you if you're <laughs> right. familiar with the scraps rocky internet relationship yeah well we had a little technical difficulties to start but again you know that's technology man right, right. so it, that just kind of like leads into the whole thing about fire service technology like you can't just you know i, I had guys just go Hey man, we, we got the map on the computer, so I don't really need to know where we're right. going. Right. I just put it on my phone. Well, you know, when when that technology takes a crap, so to speak, you know, you, you still have to go back to the old school way. You know, we we do uh, quarterly street tests. We have a policy and procedure on quarterly street tests, and I'd venture to guess there might be a handful of people that still do that. You know. No, you're yeah, hundred percent. So your I'll, knowledge I'll... doesn't fail you when the technology does. That's right. That's perfect. Yeah. Right. So, no. you know, that that's, you know, again, with thermal imaging, with everything, it's like the, 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 um, with air packs, that's CBA, man. We went from like the lightweight wireframe harnesses and 30 minute bottle, you know, we had steel, then we had aluminum. Now we have composite. Now we've just like gone back the other way to so much weight. We have like a, your, you know, a heads up display and a computer on your shoulder. It, it, it's, you know, pack trackers. Are they good? You know, probably to a, to a point, you know, I've never, had an experience where we had to like oh man where is somebody because we need the we need the pack tracker to get them and like our chief's cars have them but do they really use them do they know exactly you know is it going to work when the when the when it comes down to it i don't know no i'm with you i'm with you 
Let's we use them in the training environment, right? And what do we got? We got, you know, pallets and hay and maybe some fake smoke or something in a burn building. And, you know, it's not a it's not a warehouse or a commercial building or a high rise or whatever. Oh, it's not even a living room. It's not even a living room that that, that is your typical first do. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, just as far as like social media, again, like I just feel like it's a blessing and a curse. There's so many guys out there that that, you know, they bang away. And I thought it was really cool a couple of years ago. I, uh, another just, you know, throwing mentors out there, whatever. Frank Viscuso, um, his his keynote, man, I just felt it was super cool to listen to him just talk to the audience. You know, his he, he just had a conversation and, and he, you know, one of the things he said was like, you know, if we want to progress as a fire service, like we have to stop beating each other up on social media. And, you know, I, I just, again, we're all one fire service, but it's different. Like, you know, some of the stuff maybe we'll talk about later is like, what works for me may not work for you. Right. Or what right. works for you may not work for me. So that's okay. You know, like there's a, there's a right, there's more than one right way to do things. Right. Like when it comes to, to VES, like I, you know, I, I teach that a lot. Uh, and I, and I tell guys like, I'm not going to sit here and t- change the way you operate in, in an hour or f- an hour and a half or 45 minutes, whatever the rotation may be, but here's a couple ways to do it. And here's why. Right. You know, but if you are stuck with bailing in a window head first, because that's what you have always done, or that's what you feel most comfortable with, then do that. Like, it, you know, but know why you're doing it and, and understand, you know, what the pros and cons of that are. You know, I, I'm not a head first guy, but that's just me. Maybe now because I, you know, if I get older or whatever, I'm not doing it now because I'm a company officer, but you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's one of those things where a guy's like, oh, he's doing it wrong. Well, no, he's not doing it the same way you would do it, but right. that doesn't wrong i mean certainly there's a wrong way to do things well and it's the discussion we need to be able to have the discussion without it being polarizing and you're evil and i'm good and i'm right and you're wrong we need to be able to have the tactical discussion on why one way may be better or not and then apply it in our jurisdictions yeah totally like it you know again like i said it's 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 like you can't understand emotion over a text message right so that's the whole thing about the keyboard warriors or whatever you want to call them like i've just and I, I think I, I remember like Kurt saying this in, in one of his things, like he, you know, don't engage, right? Like don't engage because it's, there's just, there's never a good outcome. You're never going to win, right? Like you, you have your opinion about something, somebody else has their opinion and it just, it just doesn't work. So no, I love it. Hey, everybody out there, get your questions in. If you want to ask JJ questions, please throw them in here. Uh, we will pull them out and I will throw them at him, put him in the hot seat 100%. Because uh, I'm just rambling on, so people. <clears throat> no, no, hundred percent. This is awesome already. I'm loving the conversation. I'm gonna catch you up. Uh, someone said there's some good ones that I've already missed a couple times. Uh, JJ did it talking about Tim Clett, Buff, Michael Cham, Mike, Michael. I said Michael. Mike Champo said Buff become ultimate firefighter. B U F F. Uh, there we go. If you love it, don't deny it. Love me some Buff dudes from Daniel Austin. There was one I wanted to throw in here, which was buffing seconds. Yeah, that was <laughs> Jeff Stone said buffing seconds. There you go. But, but you know what? Another aspect of it too, and I just just you know, since you said that, is you learn too, man. You you're going to oh, fire, yeah. and and you're just sitting there and watching. You know, I can tell you how many buildings I've seen collapse under fire just being there, like watching you know a building, a, a two and a half story frame, fully involved and and just waiting and knowing and like you know, it's coming down and, or seeing that, or even, even an ordinary constructed building coming down and like, you know, talk about building construction and, and collapse class 101 firsthand. Like you can't, you can't beat that. And you're not having to sit there and work and you're not tunnel visioned in. I'm just taking in the whole thing. And I remember this one time, uh, one, this one trip that Kurt, Matt and I were on, we were in the van, we were like on the far West side of town a fire was on the east side and we were just, we were way late to it, never going to make it. But another box came in, it was a, 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 an apartment building that had been uh, firebombed. It was like, it was daytime still. And we got there and, and Kurt had the video camera and he did a 360 around this. It was like a 75 by 200 building. And and he 360, the whole thing, you know, videoing. And this is like, man, you, you can really, you know, take that in and just look at it later and go, all right, what do I, you know what I mean? What do I see here? What are we looking at? And, and, dial it in. There's a class, right? There's a firehouse training at the kitchen table right. where you don't go out and do something, you know? So I love it. it. If guys want to knock it, but you're, you know, it's all about learning, right? It's all about the job. You ready for your first question from the audience? 
It's a tactical question. It comes from Jane, James Mitchellisco. He says, JJ, what is your hierarchy of decision making when entering through a window between VES or just a window entry? Hierarchy. Say it again. Hierarchy. Of... Just your hierarchy of decision making when entering through a window. So, like, I, I just, I always try to break things down where I can count them on one hand because I'm not that smart, right? So, right on. We're gonna look at like at three things initially. If I'm sizing up a building, like where where's the fire? Where do I think the victims might be in relation to the fire? So, like a targeted window, maybe is you know, and then you know, some some. How am I gonna get there? Right. So those those are the first three things I'm looking at: the the building, the fire location, and possible victim location. Like a two two story house, right? Typically, bedrooms gonna be on the second floor, so we're gonna target there. But a lot of guys too, when we talk about VES or window entry, whatever is. It's not always second floor VES. You know, the backside of the fire is one of those things we we talk about a lot, and we we preach that in, in our job a lot. You know, and that doesn't necessarily mean the C side of the building or the th the three side of the building. It's behind the fire. It's like what you can't. So we're inside team, outside team, as far as our truck companies go. So two, the officer and the and the right jumper, the inside team, the driver. Nice. Your more senior right or promoted guy, he's the 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 outside team with the left jump, and that's your more senior crew. They're doing they're making their way where we can't get because we're going in where the first line's going, right? We're locating the seat of the fire, maybe forcing the door, bringing the, the line in and searching there. They're searching the playing field that we can't get. So nice. it's not necessarily, hey, it has to be a second floor VES, it could be a one story frame, and you're going to the you know, a, a side door or a rear door or a window, even right, you know. No, so, absolutely. And then, and and that's one thing we're really stressing right now is we rewrite our SOGs and stuff. Where I'm at is is the search size up is just as important as the scene size up and just identifying those those places where you have options to yeah, occupy that space. And I and I say this all the time and, and because what happens when, when you're under that stress of of okay, now it's whatever, two thirty in the morning and there's fire showing and you get that, you know, tunnel vision in is and we all do it, right? We make a ton of EMS runs. So we're, I'm walking up to a building as a company officer. If it's, you know, whatever, just an ordinary run in the mill run and looking at the building and testing myself. What is this window? What, what do I think this window is? What's behind this window? And then when I go in there, Look I test this. myself and I know, yeah, verify. did I get it right? Did I get it wrong? But, I, you know, in my mind, I'm always right, right? You, right. No one <laughs> ever get it wrong. Like, oh, oh shit. I fuck, no, sorry. I, you know, messed up on that one, but you know, you it's, learn it's a scrap. You're safe, brother. You don't have to and, censor. And then hopefully it becomes second nature to you, you know, but you can look at those things and, and kind of decide those. If that kind of answers the question about the hierarchy is, you know, need to know the fire location, right? We need to know what's our possible victim location and then how are we going to get there? Right on. No, and if you're asking maybe about window entry is uh, there's, there's a couple things, obviously, you know, where's the, how high is the window off the ground? Is there a high first floor window? You know, how high was the sill height? How big is the window? You know, wide? Is it narrow, tall? And, and your body style, too, that's going to play into, too. How flexible are you when you're wearing your turnout gear and your SCBA? So that's why I say it's, it's not always a, oh, you have to the belly into the window or you have to straddle the sill, you know, which is my preferred method. But that doesn't mean everybody else has to do it that way, too. Nice. James asked, he followed up. He said, I guess I should clarify. What's your decision to isolate the door or just to make entry through a window? So I'm still not sure that's clear, James. Well, <laughs> but so just another another thing with that. So so right, VES, the eye is silent, right? It's always been there. Ever. So th I was just gonna mention this later on, but I, since we're since we're kind of here, I kind of feel like if you didn't get into the fire service like before 1990 or so, I don't think you've really like invented something new. Does that make does that make sense? So VES has always been isolate the room. We just didn't put the eye in there. Someone else said, oh, well, we have to isolate. You know, then the UL studies came and, and then the, I call it the F word came out, flow path. And then everybody made it a big deal. But when I learned VES, when I first came on the job, it was always find the door and isolate the room. Close the door, right? We, we called it creating a chimney, not a flow path. That was, it was a different right. term. You know, no, no, 100%. The word flow path wasn't there, but it's always been, hey, Shut the door because things are going to get better. And it's an exaggeration, but I would agree with you, except I would say the 1890s, because even like <laughs> Braidwood, Braidwood back in the day was saying, you know, don't don't get cut off the air. And uh, so nothing really is new. Right. Just, I mean, yeah. yeah, it's just I'm not like I'm out here teaching. I'm not inventing 
something new with with VES or forcible entry or, or or ladders or whatever. It was you know stuff that was taught to me. I'm basically like regurgitating things, putting my own spin on it from you know some from things that I've learned. But, right on. No, no, hundred percent. And passing it on, man, and passing it on right. from your experiential that's knowledge. That's the important part of it, right? Is is, is pass it on, but you have to just know the the hows and the whys and understand you know what you're telling somebody and i, I was gonna i don't know, you can't really see it up there in my cabinet but it was gonna make a joke about the whole the um nozzles which when you said 1890s uh the whole you know truck joke about open close with the nozzle right. um this nozzle i have back here is actually op um open close it's opposite really it's from the 1800s yeah nice cool. okay so, you know, it's not as simple as everybody makes it out to that engine stuff, right? Sometimes. Uh, Dave Prescott, Faster Ranch, wants to know, because you, you're Florida, you deal with impact windows. And he says, uh, what, what's your power tool of choice for taking impact windows? How about window? from – oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. He says, how about from a ladder? Does a second floor entry with impact windows change your tool of choice? Yeah, certainly. I, I would think we don't come across them as much. We don't have the same codes that they do on the okay. coast. But they're they're certainly out there. Um, saw power saw. We now have the uh, nine inch Dewalt. Right. Uh, man, that that saw off a ladder way better than carrying a, a nine seventy. You know what I mean? Just as far as yeah, you know, just <laughs> sheer poundage. Yes. Yeah. Just being able to the, the torque. You know everything. Got and you know you you've seen some guys just operate off a ladder or climb a ladder, let alone get up there with a a saw running at forty seven hundred RPMs. You know that that could be a little little hairy for some people. Just the sheer torque will try to twist the ladder, yeah, yeah, without a doubt. So uh, I, I think that we we got the nine inch DeWalt's maybe two years ago, not even, not even. Um, and you know we had a, a a fire where some guys were caught. Actually, I say we don't come across hurricane windows behind some uh, hurricane glass and some sliding glass doors, and it was on a rear porch, and there were bars over the back, and the guys were able to get a small hole in the, in the bottom of the door. And smoke was, you know, pumping out under pressure, and they they uh, choked out two nine seventies trying to cut the bars off. So, uh, you know, that was the catalyst for us getting those things. We were already looking at them, but uh, I, th I think that kind of pushed it along a little bit more right for on. us. So every truck company has one of those now. We don't have yeah. the uh, battery chainsaws, but I think those would be uh, great too. We used to use um, chainsaws too when we actually we taught a class at the fire conference on hurricane windows, um, and they chainsaws used to... work. Yeah. Okay, I, I would not have guessed that. I would not have guessed. We don't deal with it at all here, so it's not something on our radar. But, but yeah. one, one thing you do have to keep in mind with those, man, is you have to be on air, like be breathing air, because you know how, like, when you cut a windshield with a windshield saw, and you're cut, that's like a fine mist of of uh, stuff that you don't don't want to breathe in. Right on. Be calling one eight hundred miso. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? That's a joke. That that mesothelioma, you know, like the yeah. You don't want to breathe. You breathe definitely in. don't want to be dealing with it for yeah. sure. Uh, sorry, pulling up the notes. There we go. So touch just, on social. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, just just talking about teaching. You know, um, and I think uh, again, I'll just you know throw Bob's name out there. Talked about just the basics, and and I first learned that at, at uh, when when Matt and I went to Jim McCormick's class. Man, is just mastering the basics, and and you know I kind of said it, but talking about like sometimes everybody comes to a class expecting like the next new thing, right? Like what's the new trick or gimmick or the trick of the trade or whatever. And sometimes it's, there's really not one. Right. So it's understanding the basics and, and you watch some people, you know, hold a halligan or swing an ax and you're like, you, you need to work on that before you try to get to the next, you know, fancy trick, you know, to, to force a door. So I, you know, the, Jim, I think has it down to a science as far as teaching the basics and repetition, you know, they talk about muscle memory. Like I said, I'm not going to change somebody in, in an hour, hour and a half class, right? I'm not going to, you have to go back and practice that same technique over and over and over again before six months down the road, you're going to be able to bust that out at 2 a.m. and force a door with it. Like if you learn it one time and you do it in class and you don't go back and, and do that hundreds of times at, at your firehouse, it ain't happening. Right, right. No, that's beautiful. Yeah, second alarm, first do truck K. Michael Champo says, <laughs> someone said, time to buff Manhattan. They've got a second alarm fire in an e-bike store. Oh, that should be a good one. That'll probably be a third awesome. of them. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to do something where we do the Citizens app. You know, Frank Lieb always talks about the Citizens app and where we, we just get on the Citizens app and we can virtually buff 
right here. We'll just we'll get on the Citizens app and virtually buff and pull it up and, and show the, the live feed. There is something because I do have a, a New York City Firewire notification on my phone. So Champo said box one seven two three. There you go. <laughs> hey, this might be something I do is we actually get on, we we virtually buff and we sit here and discuss it. That'll be fun. We'll talk about it. Uh my, Mitchell Dempsey said, What's up from Alberta, Canada? Sorry I'm late. Welcome from Canada. Uh Raymond Big Black Door of All said, laugh out loud, good joke. So he liked your mesothelium joke. <laughs> all right. So you got one one chuckle at least. Well, while we're on to Canada, I, I want to uh, – can I just do like a shout-out to my uh, – I don't know if you want to talk about it now or do you want to keep on moving? Dude, kind of, this is, this I, is I your strap. I'm along you know, for the ride, brother. My, my, I'm like a one-track mind, and I you know see a squirrel over here. But uh, I, I call it like our international alliance, the, the BG crew, uh, Bowling Green State University. Um, it, it's a, a group of guys that I teach with there at Bowling Green State University in Ohio, and uh, they have a state fire school twice a year. Nice. And, we're international because we have Andrew Broussard from uh, Milton, Ontario, as as one of our uh, instructors. Talk about another guy if he hasn't been on your scrap. Need to have him. You should have for sure. That, I'm always that, looking. Always looking. Yeah, dude, good, good dude. And not just him. Probably I could say name, name, and I will. I'll run down the the names of every guy in that crew, and and they should all. You they know, should all get a scrap. Yes. Hey, yeah. I'll definitely pick your brain. Well, you've had some of them on. You've already had some of them on. So Andrew Broussard from, from Milton, uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, Mike Champo, of course, you know, truck guy. Uh, Steve Robertson, engine yeah. guy. Columbus, he's been on here. Ron Smith, training seconds, right? Another, needs, to be, needs to be on here. Yeah. Uh, Paul Hoxima, another guy from FDNY. He's actually uh, filling in Mike's spot at uh, Ladder 45 right now uh, while Mike's out. And uh, Ed Farley from uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, I, I'd have I have to mention uh, again. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Uh, it, he was like uh, Ed's bromance, Jimmy Ellis uh, from Pittsburgh. You know, who, who died of a medical illness last right year. Uh, golly, what a solid, solid guy! Talk about, you know, I, I kind of consider myself a quiet guy. He was he was a quiet guy, but it'd be like he could stand just stand in the background and listen to five guys talk about something to a group of students, and then he could come back in and throw three more things at him. You know, just a phenomenal dude. Uh, Ryan Marshauser, a guy from uh, Covington, t- Kentucky. Um, he 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 does uh, like some man and machine stuff, but he's on the rescue company there. Um, I actually worked with his dad in Cincinnati, uh, nice. and uh, a great guy he was a, a driver there. And unfortunately, he he passed away um, last year. His dad he retired retired for a couple of years and, and then and then passed away. Right uh, on. Greg Gilbert is a guy from uh, Mifflin, Ohio. He's uh, right outside of Columbus uh, by uh, by Steve over there. And uh, Larry McCormick from Chicago. Right on. I've tried. I reached out to Larry a couple times. Yeah. So he's I'll get him. Another guy that it'll, it'll take a, it'll take a lot of doing to get him on the scrap because he's right. a pretty 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 humble humble Probably, guy. You know, I've got that from him because he's like ah yeah. yeah. But no, hundred uh, percent. Another tactical Hoffman. question coming at. Yep. What's that? Okay, I was just. A couple more, Jake Hoffman from from Toledo, and then Danny, who was who mentioned earlier, Danny Stelter, and uh, Chris Major uh, from Indianapolis. Dude, there you go. I got like half Found a year out. worth of scraps right there. Yeah, all all great, and I learned a ton from those guys. They're all just just great guys and, and bang up dudes. Some people might not know who they are because they're just you know humble guys, but they're phenomenal, you know, firefighters and instructors, and and love the job. There's probably a couple buffs in there too, and good at what they do. Yeah, right on. Uh, James Mitchellisco also. Uh, he likes the questions coming, so here you go. Right. And I appreciate it, James. So thank you. Keep them coming. Uh, when you are first due and conducting primary search, do you prefer to find the fire and search back, or start your search from entry? What's your uh, What's your call on the that, truck? Yeah, that's a good. That's a great question because we've always been taught, like you know, go to the fire and then work your way out, right? Because that's where the you know the victims are going to be most endangered. And and I've kind of always subscribe to that theory i guess you know and, and kind of conditions dependent if you you know you go in and it's down to the floor well that's gonna you know make it a little bit harder sure but certainly if you can get down low obviously as the officer i have the tick i let my guy go ahead so once we get the door open um i would use the thermal imager kind of get a quick layout and then let my guy go first and i'll be the oriented person um, but we would definitely like look at the fire but we just did a, a scenario back back at fdic this last year with an apartment and it worked out perfect like where the kitchen was off to the left but the bedroom was off to the right and after talking to uh, ron and some other guys about the uh, ul studies with the the primary search study um i don't know that that's always 
the best way to go is going straight to the fire. Like if maybe if you're in a smaller place and you can split your crew and, and you know, like maybe I'll go check where the fire is and send my guy like to the bedrooms in the back. Like, you know, if there's nobody, if it's a kitchen fire and, and you take a quick, quick peek down low with your light or your thermal image or whatever, and you don't see anything. And then you head to the bedrooms where, you know, a better chance of finding a victim would be, I would say, you know, that would be a, a go-to move as well. I, again, it's kind of situation dependent. You can't say I'm always going to do this or never going to do that. Right. But I think it did kind of open my eyes to not always going directly to the seat of the fire. Love it. There you go, James. Perfect question. Keep the questions coming. I'll, as always, I love, love, love the audience's interaction with the questions. So keep them coming. Back to our list of topics. Moving on to, no, yeah, we got that. No new nozzle techniques. There's no new conventional forcible entry techniques. Size up, testing yourself. Uh, we, you know, I kind of mentioned that, just the, okay. the whole thing about, you know, looking looking at buildings and looking at windows and just approaching buildings uh, from a certain way. Um, but I, I will, I have, I just, and I have to kind of like look at a note to, to tell us because I don't have it memorized. Um, but I just wanted to like point out something in our SOPs and we kind of, you know, delve in the, the search topic, right? Like, so everything we do on the fire ground basically supports the search, right? Right. So I was like, my joke, my... I, I think I'm funny a lot, but a lot of guys like don't laugh at my jokes. Like I always said, like I was the best truck company lieutenant on the fire department because I knew it took an engine to put out a fire, right? You get some guys that get on the truck and they're like, we don't, you know, like, we're, you know, we're the best. We, we don't, but you have to understand, right? It takes an engine to put out a fire, not a truck, right? We're not going to go over there. Maybe if it's something small, we can hit with the can, right? But nine times out of 10, we need the engine, but everything that we do, the engine does, the truck does, it supports the search, life safety, our primary mission. So it, it's working together. And we're, we're lucky in my department that we have that engine truck culture, if you will, or we, we operate that way where most departments don't. Right. You know, we, we have 18 engines and we have eight trucks. So that are staffed with four guys and a heavy rescue that's staffed with five. Right on. So, you know, we have that ability to engine guys are stretching a line, truck guys are doing search and we do like i said the inside outside thing where you know we're we're doing that two-pronged approach where we're giving it everything we got to get that search done from both sides both sides of the playing field you know so oh, absolutely absolutely it, it, yeah like some places do things different we're, we're not big on vertical ventilation you know but that doesn't mean we won't ever do it but it doesn't mean it's right or wrong like i said before like you know i was just uh somewhere and uh, the question was asked it and uh Mo Davis from Houston answered the question. And those guys get after it, man, with vertical ventilation. And that's their thing. And when I worked in Cincinnati, man, I just, it just about, it didn't matter if it was a first floor fire in a three-story building. There were two aerials to the roof, like everywhere. And, and I've talked to some guys, and I think Ryan Marshauser, who's, whose dad used to work there, like they're kind of getting away from that mentality a little bit. But, you know, again, that's what works for you, right? So I'm not going to go and get on the internet and do my social media posts and say, well, why would you, you know, vent if that's what they do and that's what works for them? Then, then so be it, you know, but we, we've developed our SOPs and we have seat assignments and tool assignments. And I think that takes a lot of the guesswork out and that that's right. where, you know, departments have issues. And I think that's where, again, where we're super lucky that we have that engine truck culture of engines do engine stuff, trucks do truck stuff, whether it be, you know, forceful entry, doing a search, it's, it's not, you know, again, everything we have to do, life safety, the number one priority is get in there and get that search done. So that, that that's, you know, when, when, yeah, just the whole, the whole, thing, the whole thing, we can delve into the whole thing about, you know, how dangerous it is and line of duty deaths and, and all that kind of stuff where, where we've got this culture of, you know, transitional attack and, and, you know, hit it hard from the yard, whatever. It, it, if that, if that's what your department is set up for, because you have, three guys showing up and the next crew's not getting there for, for six or seven minutes, then, you know, that's what works for you, but that's not, we can't preach that to everybody. No, hundred percent. And I, I think it. guys try to put it, put everybody in a box and you can't, right. do you can't No. you know, tactics are local. Staffing is local. Um, absolutely examine what you do and compare it to the best practices of what's going on, but you have to apply it to the tools you have, the staffing you have and the apparatus you have arriving on scene in the timeframes you have. Uh, Wilbur Kurt Isaacson has a question coming at you. 
biggest thing JJ took away from the Oscar Armstrong LODD? All right, we're, can can we pause that and come back to that? Because that's that's on the list. If you can re, if you can remind me, because I will I will remind you because it's on. If there's it's anything on, after I ask there. about twenty more questions, I'll forget. But absolutely, it's, it's, I don't want to on there. We're gonna get there. So I just yeah, because I just want to finish this and we'll, then we'll we'll move. No on. no no, go ahead go ahead. It is you know every fire department looks through blinders, right? And that's happened to every department I've worked for. So just since he mentioned that. So I worked for the city of Cincinnati and I was there uh, for about five years. And and during that time was was when Oscar Armstrong uh, died in the line of duty on March 21st, 2003. And, you know, we we were the first in the nation was, was on our patch. Cincinnati Fire Department was the first, you know, fully paid fire department in the nation. And they thought they invented firefighting. You know, may, maybe back in the 1800s we did, but in, in 2003, we couldn't operate in that silo, and and we found that out the hard way. Um, so you know, there's definitely there's a bunch of takeaways from that, and and I think you know just to answer part of the question, you know, one of those things is you have to look outside yourself, right? You have to look outside your department, and and I feel like I work for the city of Orlando now, and we're that same way. There's guys that know our 343 page. SOP manual inside and out, and they can command a fire based on going down a, a checklist. But I also try to tell guys like, you know, like what, what Kurt preaches about, you know, does the second engine always need to catch a hydrant? Not really, but we're, we're, that's just the way we operate. And it's hard to get that culture change. You know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of talk about culture and culture change and doing it from the bottom up or the top down. How does that work? But you, you have to look outside yourself. There's no way that you can improve as a department if you don't. No, that's 100%, brother. 100%. You cannot fix what you are unaware of. Right, right. You don't know what you don't know. And, and I yeah. think like trying to get guys like, you know, there's guys on my job that, that make fun of the, the, the county department because they daisy chain. They operate that way. Where, right. Where, don't, but we're, we're, we've moved on from 500-gallon booster tanks to 750-gallon booster tanks. And – you know, two engines in a 1,200 square foot or a 1,500 square foot wood frame, you know, 1,500 gallons of water. If we can't put that thing out, we're doing something wrong. Right. You turn it into a swimming pool. Yeah. You put the holes so, in there. <laughs> so, you know, like th those just those kind of things, like you have to be able to self-reflect or self-examine. And I think that was probably one of the biggest things that the, that the CFD did, the Cincinnati Fire Department with, with that was they really did. And I was on the, on the committee. I was on the safety committee at the time. And uh, so I was part of the um, initial panel, you know, or the, the uh, investigative team for that line of duty death. And, you know, we did that. We took a hard look inside at ourselves to, to find out, you know, where we went wrong. And there were, there were 47 recommendations that came out of that report. And I, I would, you know, we're going to, like I said, talk about it. And I, I think everybody should look at that, that enhanced line of duty death report that was done, you know, by not, not, it's not the NIOSH report. It's our own report that that details the timeline and how everything went and what we did wrong and uh you know what i think one of the biggest takeaways that that the that uh the fire department got and it, it and it's kind of come full circle right i think uh kevin kevin story from houston wrote that article about the the next uh line of duty deaths about death on the nozzle that kurt talks about and those things with the with the the training that we do you know pallets and hay is this this kid that they interviewed who had like two years on and he'd been in some fires but not not a ton but he he even said man the carpet was off gassing you know when he when he was going in there and you know there's your sign right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it wasn't picked up we didn't do flashover training we didn't have a flashover can at the time right and I, i'm not going to sit here and say that going going into a flashover can and and lighten you know, a barrel with with a, a bunch of uh, chopped up pallets and putting OSB on the wall is going to be the same thing as going into a, a house that was built, you know, 90 years ago. That was a 90 something year old house with wood paneling on the walls. It's not going to act the same, but to understand that fire behavior and those things, man, th those things, you know, you got to do it like that. That that just kind of leads me to, to, to our SOP is we have a thing in there that says, and I totally disagree with it. Don't give me, is don't put water on smoke. It's like an old school way of right, thinking. Very old school. Updated our our way of thinking. But you know, certainly that that thick black smoke, and and yep. you can't find the fire, and you 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 know the carpet it's yeah. so hot, and you can't. You better open that nozzle, right? We fight conditions. We fight conditions, then we fight fire. Yeah, that's black fire, right? It, you know, 
it, it just it blows my mind that that, that but people, again, if you don't look outside yourself, you read right. that and go, oh, okay. But you I'm have quoting to- Brian Brush when I say fight conditions and we fight fire. I give credit to Brian Brush. I don't know who he gives credit to, but <laughs> I don't want to steal his quote. 100%, brother. No, no. And, 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 and again, since I'm on the topic of Brian Brush, right on topic of what you're saying, uh, one of the greatest quotes he ever told me, I don't remember when it was, we were having a beer together, and he said, Corley, when you get outside the walls of your fire department, you realize that the fire department has no walls. And I was like, whoa, the fire service. But yeah, it was like, he's absolutely correct, man. That's where the growth is at. Because you can silo, you can get into that 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 echo chamber and just completely, you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. No, it's beautiful. So our SOPs are, you know, they're they're older. They're before the uh, all the UL studies. So I, I was going to kind of like just read a quote. Like I said, I don't have it memorized, but I did write it down just so I could not mess it up, right? But so it's just... This is something that we have under our offensive op- operation, and it says an aggressive and coordinated interior attack aimed at rescue of entrapped victims and property conservation, right? That's our offensive mindset, right? Initial attack efforts must be directed towards supporting the primary search. Like that, that's what it's all about, right? So I, I you know, how guys get sideways on that, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You know, again, it just goes down to like life safety and property conservation. Where, where, where do we, how do we not? you know, focus down, Yeah, go in there, put the fire out, you know, put that, that line between the fire and the occupants and, and make it tenable. Love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it, brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Kurt Isaacson said black cotton candy is deadly. It requires water to deflate it. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, what, you know, yeah, you got to put some, there's times you got to put water on smoke. Like, you know, I, you know, well, we don't use fog nozzles anymore. We use smooth boards and I, I'll just, Talk real quick on that that whole aspect, because I know this is like right up Kurt's alley. We had hours and hours and hours of discussion about this. And again, it kind of goes about looking outside your department. So about 16 years ago, we switched from uh, adjustable gallonage fog nozzles, Akron fog nozzles to smoothbore nozzles. And, uh, and admittedly, you know, I didn't know back then what I didn't know about, and the term wasn't out there again, attack package. Right, the attack package that that wasn't a thing twenty years ago. We we had fire hose and we had nozzles and water right. came out and we were good. Right, as long as we got like one hundred fifty gallons a minute, we were good. Well, we had a fancy sales guy that came and and sold us one inch tips for our inch and three quarter hand line. But you know, and I t- I say this like ask ninety nine out of a hundred guys on your fire department what's your go to attack line and what are they going to tell you? Inch and three quarter. Right. Right, but is it really? Right, the 1.88? Yes, and that's what we had was 1.88. We didn't know that. Maybe right. somebody knew it. I didn't know it. You I, know, would, I wouldn't have known it if you asked me 10 years ago. Right, right. So now we have this 1.88 hose, and now we have a one-inch tip, right, a pretty big orifice for one inch, and it you know, goes against the whole the old uh, Freeman ratio, Freeman. right, of more than, more than half diameter. And it was a nightmare. It was a disaster, but no one would own it. Like, and they wouldn't for 15 years, as many people as I could tell. And I'm not taking credit for, for the change that came, but I, I told people we're doing it wrong. And and every time I went to to water on the fire or any other conference, and I would talk to what I would consider the subject matter experts of engine company operations, you know, guys like Kurt and Ray McCormick and Steve and the Elkhart guys, and, and I'm like. I haven't found a fire department outside of the city of Orlando that, that runs a one inch tip on an inch three quarter line. We're, <laughs> we're crazy, right? right. It kick guys ass, right? The nozzle reaction was unbelievable. The kinking problems, we went out and we, we trained and we've tried to, the guys would throttle the nozzle back and forth and, Oh, well, you know, over pressurize it and do all this stuff. And it's like, w- what are we doing here? You know? So finally we, you know, fast forward, we're, we're getting some, a new, generation of engines and we changed our whole hose loads and everything and and we we settled on a, a seven eighths tip so uh, i'm super happy about it love right it right on way better way better you know we we did some tests and, and and i was out there what you literally part of our testing was to have a guy one guy on a line open nozzle one inch tip in in a parking lot straight up straight line 25 feet Advance this line 25 feet flowing water. And the majority of guys 
couldn't do it or they bailed down like without us saying anything like just get from here to there they would they would half bail or bail down right and i'm like we're gonna be flowing more water with a seven eighths tip than we are with a one inch and it was that's hard for people to, to fathom like we're going backwards but we're really not right we're going forward because now we can move now we, now can, we can keep it move. open yeah yes so no. it was a, it's a win-win, man. It was a win for, I love it. I love it. You know, it's awesome. Don't have pistol grips on them either. You know, we didn't with the one inch tips either, but man, just a smooth bore nozzle. It's, it's super simple. It's a great tool. And the, the, the less nozzle reaction, it's just, I'm super and it's sexy. Let's be honest. It's sexy. Yeah, I'm super happy, but I know it's not for everybody, you know, and, and no, it is. Know. I'll say it's for everybody. They just don't know. It. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. I'll but, say it. Yeah. Uh, James well, Mitchellisco says, JJ, how have you <laughs> dealt? This is this is our guy tonight. He's got the yeah. questions coming at you. How have you dealt with the paycheckers versus the guys who love the job when it comes to training? Big challenge for a company officer: the so-called salty versus the guys who are nerds. What's your take? <laughs> you know what? They're everywhere, right? You're you're never gonna. You can't waste your time on a paychecker if that's what that's what you want to call. That's and the I, term. And, 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 and I and I don't mean that like you you can you can try right you you can work on them and get them to, listen i'm a company officer now so i have the most like i love it because if if i want to make everybody go out and do something we're going to go out and do something before you couldn't do that right when you were the the firefighter or the driver or whatever like yeah you could make suggestions sometimes your officer what if your officer is the guy that doesn't want to do anything right then how do you handle yeah, that that's a lot worse right but you can go out and do stuff on your own but you, you can motivate guys. You just have to, I think, get guys to understand the importance. And I, I just, back in the day, I, I would say this, like, give me 10% of your day, right? We work a 24 hour shift. Give me 10% of your day. So two and a half hours, 2.4 hours of your day, like checking out, putting your stuff on the rig, checking out the rig, doing the firehouse duties and outside of calls. I need 10% outside of calls, right? Those, right. I, can't, I can't help that, but sure. You could devote, you know, that much time to your job every day. I think everybody would be better off, right? And and whether that's, you know, me as the company officer saying, all right, load up, we're gonna go do do this, or we're just doing something at the firehouse. But I, I think for I don't know how it works in in every place, but certainly if the company officer is telling everybody it's it's time to train, they're they're not gonna be sitting in the recliner. Now they may not be fully engaged in doing things, but you you can then. And I don't, you know, you don't want to like, <laughs> cause I, I've had this experience, right? I'm definitely not the same company officer today that I was 10 years ago. You know, I, you make mistakes, right? And you learn from those mistakes. Hopefully. And yes. <laughs> right. But, but nobody's perfect, right? Sure. We're, we're no, all 100%, 100%. So, you know, trying to stump people, stump the chump or call people out in front of people doesn't, that doesn't work. You know, and what do they, what do they say? You can't shame the shameless anyway. Right. You know, um, but I, I, I made that mistake, man. And not trying to do it, it, it happened. You know, I, I asked a guy something who was <clears throat> driving me for a day and he wasn't even a driver, he was a relief driver. And and the the response that I got from him wasn't even a, a, a verbal response. It was a, a deer in the headlights look when I asked the what I thought was a pretty, pretty simple question. And it kind of snowballed from there and and you know, then of course the rumor mill goes all around. And by the time you know, the right to the other other districts, it was I. You know, the fire service never takes a story and runs. No, it. no one would ever want to work for me. I was this terrible guy. You know, right. You know, here down the road, I've had guys come. You know, hey, want to work with me? Or you know, not everybody, of course, but you know, there's there's obviously the good good go getters, guys that love the job or that that want to do stuff are going to you know seek out those places. That's that's kind of a, a hard question to answer, and a lot of those like how do you change the culture questions are, are tough to answer because it's different for everybody, you know, and, right on. but you, you, you just got to keep doing what you're doing. Like I said, I used to let it get to me, you know, guys that made fun of me about being a buff or whatever, but you know what, man, I ain't got time for you. I don't, I don't care. I don't know where it came from. I love this quote. I can't, I know where I heard it from is from major Davis at station one and my department. And he said, if you're the same person you were 10 years ago, and this is his quote. So, please roll with it. But he said, if you're the same person you were 10 years ago, you're probably a piece of shit. And, <laughs> I mean, it's a great quote. It really oh, good. is. I'm glad, I'm glad I said that I'm not the same guy right. I was 10 years ago. No, but hundred percent, man, life is about growth. And if you're not growing, then what are you? And I, it may be a harsh quote or maybe too harsh of a metric, but 
like let's be honest man it's a it's a great way to measure yourself you got to be growing every day that's the whole purpose of this whole existence we're doing uh well, that's that's part of leadership too right is 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 growth but making mistakes too absolutely and admitting those mistakes and learning from those mistakes and sharing those those at those failures no uh let me see what we got just had this conversation yes that's josh uh yeah sorry they're scrolling by iceman says it helps to have a good senior guy on your shift as a company officer absolutely there yeah, we go that's that's no. another thing is you we have you know with with the way our, our department operates is you know obviously with with ems and ems transport we took over transport a number of years ago guys don't want to be on the medic and we have so many guys just it promoting so soon that you have mm -hmm. such a young generation and some of those guys don't have enough knowledge and experience to to be able to right motivate, teach their guys you know what I mean? Because they don't know, you know, and that's, I, I'm not, not like knocking anybody in, in my, in my department. It's not, you, you know, malicious or any, anything, but, but there's, you have to go out and, and guys that we just don't have that. It's hard. Cause I'm in that place where my department doesn't necessarily have that culture of promoting going to conferences. Right. I mean, talk, you know, talk about the Orlando fire conference. I've been doing it for, for over 20 years now. That's, a, that's our conference. And believe me, there's a ton of guys involved behind the scenes that do stuff, but the amount of local guys that come to our conference is, is you know, few and far between, I, I would say. And, you know, that that's hard. And our department, you know, doesn't sponsor like train or I don't say sponsor, pay for training right. or give, you know, educational leave. And that makes it harder for guys. But there's plenty of guys that go out there and do stuff on their own, pay for it out of their own pocket, you know. Every every time I go somewhere, it's it's taking my own time off, paying my own way, whatever. But not everybody can do that either, right? You know, so there's there's two sides to it, you know. No, without a doubt, without a doubt. All right, we're. I don't. I. I man, I'm, I'm looking at my notes. I'm looking at your notes that you sent me. So I'll I'll, I'll just go back to it. The the. Um... You know the but just about search and everything and it's happening in my city because we're growing and 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 the firehouse that i'm working at right now is our first due is way bigger than it than most of the others right just because the city is growing down there and they, they have plans for two more firehouses but they're not there yet and you know we we're, we drive around and then they're building houses and they're literally almost on top of each other, man. They're, they're, they're eight feet apart or less, Whoa. you know, and, yeah. and we're talking good size, 3000 square foot homes. And it, it's insane. You know, the, 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 what's happening, you know, and it just kind of, I don't know. It, it remind it, it just, I think back to, you know, just the whole, about the whole life safety thing and being into the job and, and understanding is like, man, you got to get out there and understand what you have to do and what your limitations are as far as, you know, what, what's your, what's your firefighting capability and what's the time? Like I said, you can't put everybody in a box. The whole, we may be doing hit it hard from the yard by the time we get there, because that's our only option at that right. point right now, you know, and then maybe in three years when we have two more firehouses out there, it's, it's not going to be that way because, you know, if I'm pulling up to three houses under construction and it takes me nine minutes to get there, you, you know, what's, what's going to, what am I going to do with, with one, one company? Yeah. For, for five minutes or whatever. Right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Tactics are absolutely it, local. It, it's crazy that, you know, you just talk about the advances in the fire or whatever, not, not as far as like training goes, but just that we're in the year 2023 and we still have a huge fire problem in civilian and people, you know, even guys on my job, Oh, we don't go to fires. We don't go to fires, but you know, we do. We don't go to them every day, but we still have fires right. and we still have to, you know, perform at those fires. And, you know, it doesn't just happen by accident. There's luckily, um, you know, th there's enough guys out there that are love the job that, that maybe carry some guys that don't care, you right. know, uh, you know, like the whole, oh, well, the fire went out. Nobody got hurt. You know, we can't have that that mentality. You know, I, I, I think I sent you like the, the quote and it blew me away. Um, when, when I, when I saw it from, from, it's from last year, like the, um, the U S fire administration that says like, you know, during a fire today, you have the least amount of time to exit your home 
than at any time in history? Yeah. Yes. I mean, your chance of dying in a fire today are higher than 40 years ago. That, I mean, that that should like throw up red flags to everybody. Like, whoa, wait, what? You know what I mean? And, you know, of course the job is different today because society is different today. But man, with all the advances that we have, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, who, who's going to, what, what firefighters are going to raise their hand and be like, yeah, man, pro, pro residential sprinklers. You know, like we, we have more water damage from, we, we go to, you know, I would say on a pretty frequent basis, kitchen fires that are in multifamily dwellings that are put out for the most part, knocked down at least by sprinklers. Sprinklers. You know, and, and it's a win, right? It's not maybe a win for us because we didn't get to fight fire, but. It's a win know. for prevention, not yeah. necessarily for suppression, but man, if we can prevent it. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're here for when when prevention fails. You know, That's right. right? Like Kirk right. says, when, when the yep. smoke detectors fail, you know, yep. we can't fail. Yeah. And yeah, one hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. And speaking back to like Brian Brush's thing in the in the in the, the firefighter rescue survey, again, that that just goes to show like that you have to have the aggressive offensive mindset, right? We're making rescues. I I I want to say when he he said it in his class that it was like he because he made a joke about it, like oh for all you truck guys that can't do math, like nine a day, roughly, I think nine civilians a day being rescued across the country. By, by the fire service, that's, that's, that's huge, man, right? We've always, it's always, again, the whole negative thing, you know, about, you know, close calls or things that, that go bad, whatever, you know, and it happens, right? But we have, if, if we're prepared for it, we have less of a chance of it happening, Yeah. right? So, so already this year, what are we, over a thousand fire fatalities halfway through the year, right? So, you know, we're not going to get to What's Kurt's goal? Under two thousand. Right. I mean, it still could happen. You never know. But but the law of averages, right? You know, if we if we if we continue on the trend we're continuing on, it's, right. it's still a goal right. to strive for. Right. It is still a goal to strive for. So and I think Chris Major Chris Major said an expensive Who? insurance policy. Who? Uh, it's just Chris Major. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm I know that's a joke. He's sorry. I I know Chris. He, okay, fair enough. Yeah, he's, I'm just joking. So. Kind of going circling back if you want on your on your notes or whatever. So just talking about, you know, since we're talking about like fatalities and, and line of duty deaths or whatever, and it'll kind of go back to, to Kurt's question and, and studying and knowing the job. When I went to college, which I know you mentioned I got a degree in, in, in fire science uh from Eastern Kentucky University. So proud uh EKU colonel. Right on, a, right on. Guy. Um the tactics class that I took when I when I was there my first year there, um, so thirty years ago, uh, the Hackensack fire was not too far off, right? Nineteen eighty eight, and so it was only you know we're only five years removed from that back then. But I'd venture to guess, you know, the majority of guys on the job today don't even know about that fire. Hmm. And I I, I did a, a report on that for my tactics class, and and so I, I made a list of what I think. Or like some of the, and there's there's a ton more, and I, I probably have a list of like 25 because I teach at the fire academy, and I and I you know try to teach these these guys you know some history to understand you know where we've been, you know the whole thing about if we if we don't you know study history, we're doomed to repeat it. But you have to understand, but all these things had an impact, a big impact to me on on the fire service and and made things made things better. So everybody should have an understanding and have known or studied read because it's all out there now. Again, another one of those things about social media, um, you know, you can do it. Google, Google, YouTube, um, you know, Hackensack Ford Fire. And there's a, a whole video on it. It's phenomenal, right? Phenomenal. So that, that, that was, was, and I'm just going like in year order, right? There's no, not like one's not more important than the other. I'm just going back to that one, 1988. And then the, uh, one Meridian Plaza fire. One Meridian, yeah. Since late, yeah. Right? The, the, the whole thing about, you know, pre and post 1993 NFPA 14 standpipes and understand that, right? If anybody fights a fire in a standpipe building or has standpipe buildings in their first due, they got to understand that. And we do. I mean, you can go to the stairwell of our, our firehouse downtown and there's a, you know, the sticker on the outlet that says, you know, pressure at this outlet may be greater than 100 PSI, right? Like, whoa, why is that? Like people, you know, you have to, have an understanding. And I'm not the the PRV and the PRD guru. And you know, certainly uh guys like uh Dave McGrail and Bill Gustin, McGrail. right, McGrail, right, all, all those guys that 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 know that stuff. But I mean, you have to have some understanding, right? As to why and how 
So I think that's that's another important one. Um, and <clears throat> the Bryceland Street fire for me is the next one, 1995, February uh, 14th of 1995, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, Bryceland Street, they, they killed three firefighters and it was a, uh, a fire, a single family home, but it was like two stories in the front and four stories in the rear. You know, Pittsburgh is a pretty hilly city. Right. Um, but uh, we, we at FDIC taught alongside uh, the class called RIT Combat Drills um, with Jim Crawford and his group for a good number of years. A, a, a total great bunch of solid guys. But, uh, you know, ta and talking to him like that was that he was he was on the Pittsburgh Fire Department. Uh, Jim Crawford was w when that fire happened. And that was like a catalyst for him. I mean, he devoted his life, you know, basically his fire service career. Anyways, he's still on the job. He's retired from, from Pittsburgh, but to teaching writ, right. You know, out of that. And, you know, it was the first, that was one of the first fire reports that I ever read because I was, I was um, doing an internship at, at my uh, fire department through college. And my uh, chief at the time was the president of the international association of fire chiefs. And he got a bound copy of that uh, line of duty death report from those. And I, I got hold of it and I read that thing. And I, I was like, you know, it was like an eye opener again. Right, so right. you know, one of those things. Um, and and no. they all have, there's so many lessons to be learned from them. No, hundred percent. I don't want to break your flow. Cause I want you to break down all of them and say what you want to say. I am going to do my thing where I take a break for a second and leave you to run the scrap. So it's all yours for a minute while you break down LODDs and I'll be right back. Okay. Man, what if I have to take a break? So uh, number four for me is the uh, May 31st, 1999, Washington, D.C. fire, Cherry Road, uh, two line of duty deaths uh, in the basement. And, you know, again, just today we're talking about flow path and ventilation and, and things that guys didn't understand or didn't know back then, um, you know, that, that had an effect on that fire and, and killed two guys in the line of duty. And there's just a ton of stuff to the NIST modeling that they have for for that fire that that you can see uh, again, just just so many lessons to be learned. Um, and you know, if you don't know about this next one, then you've like you know got your head buried in the sand. But December third, nineteen ninety nine, the Worcester Cold Storage Warehouse. Um, you know, the, the, uh, man, talk about leadership. Uh, you know that Chief McNamee, you know having to having to tell his guys, you know, no more, we're not losing any more. But, you know, those guys went in and, and knew they had a job to do, reports people trapped, and they went in there and, and gave it their all, you know, and, and six guys died. And I, I remember, so I was in the fire academy at the city of Cincinnati at the time, and, and I saw on the news in the morning when I was getting ready to, to, go, to go to work. And uh, I was like, I never thought, you know, in, in my lifetime that there would be, you know, six guys killed in the fire at one time. But, you know, there we were, you know, back then. So, um there's there's the it's an Esquire magazine. It's called the Perfect Fire. There's like a whole story on that fire, which is a pretty phenomenal uh, writing. So, um, and the next one you may not know because people call it the the Forgotten Fire, but uh, the Keokuk, Iowa fire that was later that month, December, I think it was like just before Christmas, um, in Keokuk, Iowa, small town, you know. Fire in a two-story frame, uh, reports of people trapped. There were like three kids uh, trapped, and these guys, you know, they again, it, it goes back to the, your, you know, your department, your staffing, your apparatus. Um, six guys showed up on the scene, you know, initially, and, and they're making a fire attack, and then they they leave the line to go do these searches for these kids, and three guys end up dying, you know, and and the three kids that they were searching for ended up dying, but you know. A lot of people don't know about that. I remember sitting in a class and I think it was uh, Ray McCormick posted the picture. Uh, there's this pretty well-known photo from that Keokuk, Iowa fire with the, the gray two-story house with the smoke pumping out. And like, he's like, does anybody know what this, you know, what this picture is from or this fire? And, and, you know, it's just one of those things I've, uh, you know, you kind of forget that one because the Worcester warehouse fire kind of overshadowed that. Um, Keokuk, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and Kurt said 3,000 degrees. I don't know if you mentioned 3,000 degrees. If you read I didn't. I, I talked about the, the thing called okay. the Perfect Fire uh, from Esquire Magazine, but that, that is another one. I, I uh, Yes, 3,000 degrees. Um, the next one is uh, July 4th, 2002, Gloucester City, New Jersey. 
Um, again, you know, guys, reports of people trapped, right? Heavy fire, those guys went in, they pulled everybody out, and then they were like making one last ditch effort to try to go in and save these kids, and, the, and then the wood frame building collapsed, you know? But, uh, you know, that's just, even though, you know, they were do, trying to do the right thing, or, you know, it's not, again, sometimes we're, we're doing everything right, and, and bad things still happen, right? You know, maybe, you know, guys will Monday morning quarterback that and look and say, well, they should have never been in there, but man, you know, how do you know you weren't there? Right. You weren't in that situation to say, yeah, I wouldn't have gone in there or whatever. But, um, you know, anyway, and then uh, here locally, kind of, uh, I wasn't here at the time, but I remember getting the phone call like, hey, man, they just killed two guys here uh, it was July 30th, 2002 in Osceola County, which is like one of the next counties over uh, from us in a training burn. And 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 some members from my department were, were there. Um, one of our companies was there um, like. I don't want to say mutual aid, but taking part of the training because it was an acquired structure, a live burn and an acquired structure. And, you know, obviously those are sometimes hard to come by. So everybody, you know, loves to go join in on that. But uh, uh, John Mickle and, and Dallas Begg were the two two firefighters. One guy was 20 years old, Dallas Begg, brand new firefighter, you know, doing some live fire training. And and man, you know, do we ever want to kill anybody in training? Absolutely not. You know, and that was devastating and, and it's terrible. The whole situation was terrible. Um, but it led led the state of Florida to adopt NFPA 1403 for, for the live burn requirements. You know, it, it, we all you know know that that the NFPA is not always for practical application, and it's not law until you know your state adopts it as law. So you know, for us doing live burns now, we have to follow 1403 to a T. The stack of paperwork is this big. I'm a live fire instructor because I teach at the community college, and we you know for our department too. And it's so watered down. That kind of goes back to what I was talking about with the uh, the flashover simulator. It's just not the same, right? You you know, pallets and hay in a concrete burn building don't don't react the same way, right? That, that a house fire does. It, it so you know, are we doing ourselves a disservice? I I certainly think so. But you know, it's what we have to work with, and that's that's why it's important to again. It doesn't have to be a, a hands on type drill. You go back and, and and you you know you look at the NIST study of it, or you look at at whatever. And, and then you go, man, you know, what would we have done in this situation? Or, you, you know, you just got to find a way to learn, you know, you got to find a way to do it because we don't do the live fire. I mean, you know, go back when I was in college in the nineties in, in Kentucky, we, they'd have the state had nine regions and they did weekend fire schools. And every other weekend, the group of guys I was with, we were going to these fire schools. It was like 30 or 40 bucks to take a weekend class. And we, we were burning down houses and places that we would never do today, you know, fully right. furnished piles of clothes, uh, you know, just crazy stuff. But it, man, I sure learned a lot, you know, right. you know, but um, so the next one is a biggie, um, you know, again, March 21st, 2003, 1131 laid law. Uh, Oscar Armstrong, you know, city of Cincinnati. I, I was working that day. Um, we made it to the fire scene way late you know I, I was not there when when the incident took place um but i was you know at that house later on that day um uh, and then you know obviously delved deep into that being part of the line of duty death committee um it's a tragedy man it, it's a tragedy on so many levels because it's one of those things where the dominoes start you know it's not one thing right most of them it's not Oh man, this is what happened, and and we know where it went bad. It's it's the the things that started that up, and not not to there's not blame on anyone, right, person, right. but you have a guy who was driving a fire truck as as a as a relief driver basically for the first time, right? Oh, so, and a, a young detailed guy uh, as the second firefighter, and then Oscar as a as an even newer firefighter than the other guy. So so the guys in the back seat, you know, two guys with less than three years or four years of experience, you know, you have a seasoned captain. But, you know, again, I don't want to like talk about the whole fire too long because you can certainly look up that that enhanced report, you know, hose line management. Again, back go back to the basics, you know, a 350 foot line that they stretched to the rear and then the chiefs back there and said, hey, man, it's an inside fire. Hit it from the inside out, you know, push it back out. It was a, a kitchen left a, a pot on the stove, man, a, a oil, you know, a skillet full of oil. And that's what that killed the guy. You know, in a single family house that's 872 square feet on the first floor. But, you know, not that one person did any, anything wrong, but there were fundamental firefighting skills that went wrong. 
right. you know, or, or weren't practiced or weren't followed or, or the SOPs weren't followed a hundred percent. Um, and, and a lot of these, and I mentioned, you know, earlier, like the cherry road fire and, and the Hackensack, New Jersey, and we all know that was a trust roof collapse, but it involved ventilation, right? It involved, you know, guys on the roof, you know, trying to vent the roof, um, the cherry road fire, you know, with the basement and, and, and the flow path, um, you know, this one too, they, they vented a bunch of windows on, on one side before they had water, you know? So, and then that wind's coming that direction, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, a wind fed fire. It, there's a number of factors again, you know, kinks in the line, having to go back to get a tool, you know, uh, crew integrity and all those things that, that come out of all those NIOSH reports, they all say the same thing, right? right? They're, they're, they're what generic to a point, but they, they all, they, they all have, common theme, which is kind of weird because you would think by now we would have figured that out. No, and Amanda Miller posted in the comments, the Swiss cheese model, you know, when that, when that line lines up with all those Swiss, the, the Swiss cheese lines up and all can go through all those holes, you know, it just lines up perfectly. And like you said, the NIOSH five or, or looking at the line of duty death reports, there's absolutely so much to be learned. And it's like, well, but it's kind of low hanging fruit, but at the same time, let's get it right. Let's get the low hanging fruit right. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, hundred percent. Like, like I said, the literally like one of the number one things out of that says big firefighting skills are essential. Like again, it just like, it comes full circle. I don't know how, like, I can't say it enough. Right. Like be good at the basics. Right. Right. And, and, and I've had these comments thrown to me like, oh man, you know, everybody can stretch a hose line. Well, yeah, they can, but they can't necessarily do it right. Right. You know, or, or do it efficiently or whatever, man. We, we, and I, I'm so glad that we've kind of changed our hose loads. That was another thing I was so just like frustrated with, I guess, for lack of a better term is we, we had this, this modified Minuteman load. Basically you, you load 200 feet of hose on your shoulder and it just guys go back and forth across the yard to to dump the line off their shoulder, and then you end up with a nozzle in your hand, and you've gone crossways this way, but you're gonna go, you know, make your entry this way. Like we're not setting ourselves up for success, you know, mm -hmm. from the outset. So you know, making those change, you know, it's hard, right? It's hard right to on. to look and say you don't know what you don't know. But again, I'm not the expert because I work here, right? Now I you know bring in you know, somebody from the outside and you know, then guys might listen to them. I don't know. Right. Hopefully so, we would hope, right? Some guys might not though. Basic firefightings are critical. Basic firefighting skills are critical. Crew integrity must be maintained. Yes. Well, so you had a guy from another engine company helping to staff the first line, but does that mean that that was wrong? You know, we, we talk about also like we used to, when I worked there, like, cause again, we're, you know, close companies or whatever guys would be racing to get, you know, we'd be stretching a line and then the second engine would be coming in, stretching their own line rather than, you know, again, they've evolved, right? It's not that way. It's not everybody was that way, but let's get the first line in place in an operation before we're stretching a second line, you know, and, and th that's important, right? And like, what does the FDNY do in a, with two and a half and a stamp pipe is they're, they're assigning two companies to get that thing in service. That's not lack of crew integrity, but when you have one guy from a crew that joins another crew and his officer doesn't know where he is, well, that's not crew integrity, right? right. That's not an officer supervising their crew. So, you, you know, you have to know what you're assigned. And that's where it's important to have SOPs and, and seat assignments and knowing your job before you get there. We don't show up and go, all right, well, what are we going to do now? You know? Right, right. Not, no, that's no. one thing like for us and the department around us that we, we how we operate differently. It's not a knock on them. They just do things different than we do. And- you know, I, it's it's a home run when when you get off the rig and you know where guys are gonna kind of go or where they're gonna kind of be because you know what your your assignment is, right? So it's just very helpful to me. Uh, staffing came out of that report. Effective staffing, you know, they wanted um, chiefs aides. They don't have them still. You know, twenty years later, that that it's a money thing. You know, it all comes down to money. We we they change things that can be changed. Uh, definitely. You know, a lot of training came out of that. Like I said, they had the flashover simulator now. Um, they, they do things differently. The RIT aspect of training, they call it RAT, Rapid Assistance Team. Um, you know, every truck company, initially it was just a few truck companies did it. Now every company, you know, does it. Um, they send them, they send a, a RIT truck right off the get-go, you know, on the one that used to be, okay, it's a working fire. Now you dispatch the RIT. But, you know, then you look at those statistics, right? I'm kind of a statistics guy, and I know you can make statistics go any way you want to. 
Um, but you know, the statistics show when's when's the mayday going to happen, right? Like in the first seven minutes we're of the done. fire, you Very know, when you don't dis- yeah. when you don't dispatch a company till five minutes into the fire, you know, five minutes after the first uh, you know alarm because it took four minutes for the company to get there, and then you know, okay, hey, it's a working fire. Now we're going to take two minutes to dispatch and get that next company on the road. It's right. too late. You know, so Ryan Selleck throws it in and said, unfortunately, most companies start with two to three Swiss cheese holes aligned at the start of shift. All it <laughs> takes is one or two more variables and you have a perfect Swiss cheese. Sometimes it's known things like radios, kink prone hose, basic skills, tools, on and on. It's a great point. I wanted to throw it in there. 100%. And it, yeah. It's, yeah, you you could you could go like you said, you could go on and on and right. on. Um, so I'll just wrap up with the last two on that is, uh, you know, I, you were kind of gone, but I, I said, um, with the, uh, when the Worcester fire happened and, and six guys died, I never thought I would see something like that in my career. Um, uh, and then, you know, in 2007, Charleston, South Charleston. Carolina, yeah, the Sopa, super, uh, super Sopa store fire where, where nine guys were killed that, you know, just again, another one of those like ventilation thing, you know, so many dominoes, you know, a lot. Yeah. Again, you talked about the first, the driver being like one of, on his first fire, you know, yeah. the super Sopa store. Uh, that, was, that was the Cincinnati fire with the, no no uh, it was also fire. a super sofa story. Oh, he, talk, oh, okay. he talks yeah. about it in his class yeah, yeah. So, so uh yeah I just was gonna say something and I, I forgot oh kind of leads me to this again not, not a knock this to me is like a uh a feather in, in somebody's cap is the uh ISO one rating you know which we have by the way um it has really nothing to do with the way you respond and fight fires you know Charleston, South Carolina was an ISO class one fire department and, and killed nine guys. You know, we're, we're an ISO class one fire department and we, it, it takes us eight minutes to put a company on a scene sometimes, which it wasn't always that way. Our city is just growing and, and it's hard to keep up with the growth. I'm not, you know, knocking, you know, what, what's, what's happening here. It, it just, it's, that's the reality today, right? You know, we're talking about, you know, how, how far we've come along, but how far we haven't come. Right. You know, and I, I said I said top ten, so we, we've hit ten. But I'm going to add add one more because I think it's it's super important, and it kind of almost reminds me of the uh, the the uh, Oscar Armstrong was uh, Homewood, Illinois, right? Uh, when, when those again, you know, it's a, a fire. It's the middle of the night. Reports of people trapped. It, it changes people's mentality. And I know a lot of people out there say it really shouldn't change anything. You should always expect fire, expect victims. But the reality for most people is that it doesn't happen at every fire, right? Like, not, you know, I think we've we've had one fire fatality this year in, in, in our city. And we probably average maybe one a year, you know, some, some years it's, it's been more, but so the majority of the time people are out, right? We, we, we don't take that for granted when people, we show up and they say, Oh, there's nobody in there. We, we obviously go in and do that search, but you know, this is one of those things where we're a, again, staffing an issue, but you know, stretching that two and a half inch line into a single family dwelling it, it just be, became a detriment for them you know right you know or you know i don't want to say like a death sentence unfortunately because how many guys are out there training on two and a half we we switched to two inch line you know when we did our seven eighths tip with the with the inch and three quarter we switched to to uh two inch with an inch and a 16th yeah so you no, know 100 way, 100%. Way, way more manageable but you know what that that's our our staffing we're majority um, four person staffing, but we, we do have companies that run engines that run with three, all our trucks, thank goodness are staffed with four, but you know, the, there's guys out there running with two, two and one. I mean, yeah. I don't even know what you do with one. Uh, Westbrook <laughs> tier said another LODD to study very similar to Cherry Hill is the double LODD, uh, Berkeley way. Kurt Eisen chimed in and said Berkeley way, which we got to at COBC command officer Boot Camp this year, man, we got to hear the person who did the invest. I don't remember the name of the chief. I'm sorry. Uh, someone can type it in the comments who broke down everything that happened at that fire at Berkeley way. And it was unbelievable. Like the lessons learned and the stuff yeah, like this, like a, you're talking a, about here. Yep. Another one of those with the, uh, you know, X number of stories in the front and more yep. stories in the rear um, ventilation, you know, like the, I think the, uh, the windows there, the sliding glass or whatever that got taken out in the rear, you know, Dave Franklin. Yeah. yeah they said it. Dave Franklin. Thank you guys. Okay. Oh yeah. Phenomenal chief out there yes. retired. I think. Um, yeah. So, you know, ventilation flow path all, the ul studies right they're all all the stuff if you don't and and i'm not a super studious type of guy where i'm going to sit down and read how many hundreds of pages of that and try to pull out 
what what's important, what's not, and you're going to kind of read the cliff notes of it. But the wrong, I think initially a lot of the wrong information got out there, right? You know, the the cliff notes version, or one guy said one thing about it, and then it, it's it's like the telephone game. You, right. you say something, and then. 10, 10 people down the road, it's totally twisted. Of- no, I always thought it was a wind-driven event. I really did until I, I witnessed it uh, or set through the class. Right. No, so, absolutely. But, you know, it, it's there, we have to be. I don't know what what is the science changed, right? Like I I don't I I have a hard time understanding like that we're doing things totally different now because of these studies that have come out in the last nine or ten years. That's kind of like why I referenced like. You know some of the stuff in our SOPs. It, it's been there. You know we've been doing things. I will say though, the uh, the search study, um, Ron Smith uh, was a part of that, and you know obviously um, I, a personal friend. So I've talked to him about that. And Eric Wheaton, who's uh, you know works near me, I, I talked to him about. You know there there are some important things to be learned from all the studies. I'm not not just the search study. And I'm not knocking you know not knocking the science. Right. It's hard to it's hard to believe science after 2020, but. You know, there there's some important things to be gained from all of it, but you again have to apply what works for you. Like like you mentioned before, like you know your your staffing, your rigs, your deployment model, whatever. Hello. Yep. You're no, you're there. I see okay. you not. Okay, making sure. No, one hundred percent. Yeah. So no, I was just pausing, man, because I feel like I'm just talking, talking, talking. No, I love it, man. I, I think it's great. I think it's phenomenal. I'm just listening, listening, listening. That's what I do. I soak it up. <laughs> yeah. One, you know, so like those, those NIOSH things about, um, I, I was, I was one, one that I wanted to, uh, oh, the, it's just uncontrolled ventilation, you know, they call right. it or, or ventilation induced flashover, you know, those, those things, again, it's important. And I, we just had a company officer class not too long ago. And, and one of the guys in my firehouse was, was working on one of the the PowerPoints about uh, ventilation. And, and I just, you know, told him, he was asking me some questions. I said, communicate before you ventilate, like how important that is. Right. And he, he, he like, it was like a light bulb, like went off in his head and he was like, man, I've never heard it, you know, put that way. And that simply is, you know, we, we talk about our outside team taking the fire vent and it kind of correlates with the whole like BES thing. Are you venting for fire or are you venting for life? Right, because the two are distinctly different. Right, we're venting for fire. We're we're giving that fire an outlet. Right, the the low pressure zone, you know, f- for that fire and smoke and heat to go. Versus, hey, I'm venting for BES or window initiated search or whatever you want to call it today. BEIS is you're venting in the wrong place on purpose. Right, and you're going to create that flow path and you're you're starting that stopwatch when you take that window and you have to understand all those things. It has to be about speed and efficiency. And if you can't mask up with your gloves on, then you shouldn't be taking that window until you're masked up and ready to go. Right on. Right on. No, I love, I like getting you on a roll. Then you catch me <laughs> off guard when you stop. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to throw a pause in there. Take a breath, man. I don't, I don't know. So, and, and you know what? And then, you know, the, the failure to follow SOPs and training are like the, the two next, you know, out of that, whatever top 10 that they have. And, we always talk, you know, how many times can you say it? Training, 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 right? And right. follow the basics. Like I, I just, you know, I hope I answered Kurt's question about what, what's the biggest thing I gained out of there is, is you know, it, there's things we can control and there's things we can't control. And we can control how much we train, how much we, you know, follow our SOPs, how much we maintain crew integrity, how we do things as a company officer, you know, to to be in the right place at the right time or whatever it is. And, you know, those, those it's again, the, the, if you look at two dozen NIOSH reports, they all kind of say the same thing. It's right. like, why aren't we fixing it? And I want you guys to catch that. That was JJ's answer to one question, the last hour and a half. <laughs> no, 100%. I finally, uh, finally, finally reeled it in. Like, wrapped it up, put the bow on it. <laughs> so there you go. There you there's go. Your answer. <laughs> there you go. Kurt, there's your answer. A lot of people caught it. Uh, who believes science after 2020? Uh, <laughs> See, well, I, throw, I throw a joke in there. I guess it's my, like, they're just kind of like, man. It's very I'm dry not... humor. I've, yeah. I've tried to catch on. I've tried to catch on. I've, I really am bad at it. I'm like, oh, wait, he is joking. <laughs> because you like, look at you go, are you serious right now? Uh, <laughs> Kurt said, coordination is so critical. I think that, yeah, you give the fire air, you better be giving it water, plain mm-hmm. and simple. Right. Like, you're, you're not going to, 
And, you know, I, I, that kind of goes back to, you know, I can, can kind of just go back to the fire that I was talking about earlier on my job where the, where the guys got, got jammed up was, you know, a window was taken and I, the line was there and ready to go, but then there was an issue, you know? So, you know, not, it wasn't, you know, they, they were ready. They looked, oh, hey, here's the hose line. It's going in the front door. All right, we're taking the window. And then it didn't knock the fire down and then it became an issue. Right. So communication is key. And that's probably another one of those NIOSH things is communication and, and the 360 size up and continual, you know, I hate to say that the term risk benefit analysis, you know, but it, it's, it's there, but communicate before you ventilate. And I, and I I'll tell you, and I don't know if, if, if Mike's still here, if he's buffing that uh, second alarm in Manhattan, but the time that I saw that was a trip that we took in 2009 and I can't tell you how cold it was, but it was very, very cold. And we were in New York City in January, and we're at his firehouse, and they get a fire like three blocks from the firehouse. And we get there, and it's like a six-story age type, fires in the in the throat, like on the second floor. And I watched the OV on the fire escape for minutes, standing there ready, like with his hook, ready to take the window. Right. Just waiting for for you know Mike on the radio to tell him, all right, take the windows. Right. You know, it, it, like that was like the best example. Again, see, I actually learned something being a buff. You know. Right. Right. So, Full know, circle. Full circle. So, and then it was also um, a guy that that fell through the fire escape. The fire escape kind of gave way on one of his legs, and he was it folded his leg up under him, and he couldn't get out himself. You know, and one of the guys like had to come out the stairwell. Uh, landing window and and help them out and right right i was able to use some of those pictures and get them in a magazine and 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 do some stuff so i know kurt always jokes me about that like this i don't call myself a professional photographer and he's like have you ever been paid for any of your pictures and i said yeah he's like hey you're a professional photographer. You're a pro i want to read this comment because it's really good and i want to get it into the audio for people to hear ryan Selick said this and i love this i think the worst thing ul nist did was make flow pass the boogeyman we have people advocating for control on a same level ranch house fire instead of using a flow path to vent opposite attack. I am H O in my humble opinion, flow paths can be good, bad, and benign. And I love that. I absolutely love that. And I wanted to get that in the audio of this. So I, I don't have the intelligence to say it that way, but I, I don't think anybody could have said it any better. That, like, that was beautiful. That's what, that's why I call it the F word, right? Like it's like a, it's like a bad word. Like people are using it. It's a buzzword. That that's what it is. It's just like to me, V E S and V E I S. It's it's a it's a buzzword, man. It's just a change in terminology. But you haven't changed anything that we've done for me, anyways. The way I was brought up from day one, like get in there and isolate the door. Close. We didn't say isolate. We said close the door. You know, sweep the hallway and close the door. Right. <laughs> Justin McWilliams said, "Disciplined companies know as much as when as when not to open up or take windows." And just to let you know. Mike Champo said, where's his pictures? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> Especially the picture from the D of fist pump. I don't know what that means, but. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Are we ready to look at pictures? Yeah, we can We can move on to, did, did, I, did I hammer it home enough about the, the, the line? Dude, we're, we're knocking on two hours, so you tell me. I mean, you're on East Coast. I'm still Central. Yeah. So, well, just, okay, since we're talking about lines, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this, man. Um, because we talked about, I, and I can't remember, I, I wrote, I looked it up. I think, I don't, well, I don't think, it, I don't know what his statistics are for this year, but I think, you know, it's over, obviously the firefighter rescue service over 3000 and that's just what he collects, right? That's not everybody in the country submitting their data. It's, it's huge, right? I think it's, I want to say it's like over 650 for the year or something like that. I, it's a pretty good number compared to firefighter line of duty deaths. And, you know, and I'm not minimizing them. Please don't, don't think no, no, the wrong way. Um, we're at, at 30 for the year, right? And in the research that I've done, three of them have involved fire suppression operations. Doesn't minimize them in any way. They're all tragic. They're all terrible. I've been to a large number uh, of, of firefighter funerals. I went to the uh, the Father's Day funerals in, in 2001 in, in New York City. Um, you know, I knew um, Joe DiBernardo from uh, teaching at FDIC who, who died, you know, later on after the Black Sunday fire right. in 2005. Um, you know, all tragic, tragic events. 
and, and, and you know, this m most recently um, that, that Michael Muller from Irmo, South Carolina, you know, by all accounts, love the job, into the jobs, you know, again, you can do all the training and do everything right. And sometimes, the, you know, bad things happen. Absolutely. And it's, tra it's, tra I feel, you know, I feel horrible. I can't imagine, you know, the, the, the pain and, and, and all that. I, and I mean, I I've seen it because I, I, I lived through the line of duty death funeral in Cincinnati. And, and I can tell you at the end of that time, I was physically, mentally, and emotionally drained, exhausted, you know, and I'd probably met the guy one or one or two times, but man, you know, young kids, young family, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter, man. Mm -hmm. Any, any, any one is too many. We, we all know that, but, but it certainly doesn't, doesn't mean we can't do our job and go about it and be, and be good at it and be great. And, and, you know, just do, do the best you can. Like that you can, like we said before, you got to get better, right? You just right got to keep, keep working to get better. You know, they always say you can't train enough for a job that can kill you. But no, I, I, and I don't want it, you know, don't wish it upon anybody, but I don't want the, uh, I, I think we kind of mentioned it uh, the other day was uh, Bill Carey and the data, not drama. Right. right? You know, w when 17 out of 30 guys have, have died of heart attacks or some kind of medical emergency, you, you know, listen, I, I went to school in Kentucky, right. You know, talk about, you know, 30 years ago, some, some backwoods, you know, I, I'm not, not knocking it. It's very rural, you know, kind, kind of atmosphere of volunteers and guys that have been on the job, you know, way too long, you know, when the 78 year old guy, that's a fire police officer directed traffic has a heart attack and dies on the scene that, that you, you can't throw that into the statistics and say, see, see, right. you know, that, that's the, the stuff that kind of frustrates me. And, and, you know, the, uh, Man, and they've all been kind of kind of recent, right? Like um, the Buffalo Buffalo incident that was that was very you know, Jason Arno, um, and then the two in Chicago back to back, right. man, back to know, back. Talk to Larry, um, and I think one of them, I think truly was a medical emergency. The one in the high rise, the the uh, company officer, you know, having to traverse, you know, twenty four flights of stairs, you know, kind of you know, crazy crazy stuff. And you know, a guy had been on the job a long time, but you know. Again, no one did anything wrong. Things just happened, right? So, all right, hundred percent, brother. You ready to do these pictures? I, I am. All right. So, so we just, yeah, we'll just talk a, a little bit about, uh, you know, photography or whatever you want to say. I, I, oh, I, hang on, I got it because I got. I know I sent you pictures with just some numbers. I got to find a piece of paper. I had a piece of paper somewhere. Do your thing. Do your thing. Like, Sam, Sam is here. He is going to put the pictures up. If you're if you're if you're listening to the audio version, this is the part you just have to use your imagination as JJ <laughs> talks about it. All right, so we'll go with picture number eight, and we may not get to all of them, but because uh, we're I don't know if we're running too long or whatever, but everybody's going to bed. I don't know. <clears throat> we'll see if he can pull up picture eight. Eight, eight, number eight. Okay, he's got it up. Vending window. Okay. So this is uh i don't i can i oh i can't i'm not even gonna be able to you're see not it. gonna be able to see it no okay. you gotta go off your memory Dang, i gotta go off my memory which i got a lot of them locked in bro um so this this is what i was kind of talking about before about the whole social media aspect some some guys were beating this picture up some of the stuff that was going on here and i was like again man, you, you weren't there dude it's one 250th of a second in time and you know it's a busy fire ground there's a lot happening there man there's a, an officer over there with a thermal imager and uh, lines being stretched, the guy's taking a window. And I, I, I just, you know, again, if you remember, I don't know how many, many years ago when Bill Manning, I think was the editor chief of, of uh, fire engineering and, you know, the editor's opinion or not the editor's opinion, the letters to the editor guys would write in about, Oh man, I think it was a cover from Jersey city where a guy was doing something, didn't have gloves on and somebody wrote and the guy's like, you know what? He's like, I'm just going to publish a blank white cover. You right. know, so, so all the safety Nazis will go away. I mean, it goes that far back, right? Like, People have been ever since we've been in the fire service, and especially again with the advent of social media, guys just crush stuff that they have no no knowledge of. So um, it's just one. Of, I thought it was a cool picture, and and just as a side note, unfortunately, the guy that is ventilating that window um, died of a medical condition. I think it was just last year. Um, he, he was on Kurt's job. And that 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 was. Mm -hmm. The pictures I got from Ryan with Kurt, you know, not not related to a fire or anything like that, but right. he had a you know a medical condition and he was only in his 30s. Wow, um, wow. So, so that's the Scambia yeah. County there. That is a Scambia County. So okay. I just kind of made that a little bit more special, man. That I got to catch that guy, 
you know, in action or whatever. Right. And, and just doing stuff. Cause you know, so many times I don't even, you know, know, know any guys. And someone I respect very much said, take more pictures. <laughs> so, I've, been trying to, I've been 100%. trying to do that ever since I heard that. Yeah. You know what? And, and my job doesn't have a uh, big photo culture, you know, guys, the guys don't like it. I've, I've shown up on, on fires close to my house here and there. I don't live like right in the city, but I live close and, and, you know, like, what the, what, you know, what the heck are you doing here? And it's like, you know, they call it being a tick ticking out. I'm like, I'm just, you know, taking some pictures, man, just building my portfolio. Maybe I could use it one day. And then, you know, then guys will call you or text you. Hey man, did you get any pictures of me? Right. Right. You know, so, all right. All right. We'll go with uh, number number five. We'll keep it. We'll keep it. Um, number five, Sam. Escambia. This we'll see if this. Uh, this is the first time we've tried this in a while. So this is the first time we've tried it with sand. There we go. Smoke. Firefighters working. Is it is is uh, is there a thermal imager in the camera? In the in the is there a thermal imager? I think he's holding. That's what he's holding up. The, the white helmet is holding up a thermal imager, looking into the smoke. And that happens to be Kurt, by the way. Oh, okay. I can't so, see it from okay. my yeah, okay. um, on the rocker, but I bet it says a, Isaacson. That was, a, that was a magazine cover. There was a fire rescue magazine was doing a, a nice. edition on technology and uh, you know, like fire ground technology, obviously the thermal imager and the, no, I was kind of, you know, proud of that when the guy, when I, when I sent it in wrote back, he's like, man, as soon as we saw this, when we knew that was going to be, you know, be the one that we were looking for. So, um, you know, lucky man, that was a, that was a great fire. I was, I had, ridden with Kurt for the weekend and uh, literally he was in his uh, battalion car and I was in my own car. We were going to breakfast before I was driving home six hour drive from in Florida, believe it or not, from a different time zone. And uh, we're just driving. Right. He, he's like waving frantically out the window, pulling over. And uh, I parked my car in a parking lot. I said, we got a job. And uh, I threw my camera stuff back in his car and it ended up being a great, a great fire. Yeah, catch that one. Yeah. So I got a b bunch of good pictures from that job. That was kind of just kind of funny, you know, like one of those things where um, you do it. But you know, there's just so much cool stuff that you can see, you know, from from the perspective of just kind of standing back and watching stuff. And that that's you know one of those things. So uh, since since it was mentioned, someone said something about the fist bump. So go with number six. Number six. And everybody listening to the podcast, you can you can find this on YouTube. You can find it on Facebook. If you want to see the pictures, uh, there it is. It's up, the fist bump. Yeah. You know, and again, I think there was a comment about this. Oh, man, two guys were like just fist bumping while somebody's stuff burns down in the background. And, you know, it, it, of course, that's a, that's a Detroit photo. It's a vacant. Don't worry. The ladder pipe is up and flowing. That's right there. You know, like those guys aren't in there like doing a search or anything. It was the thing was going from front to back, you know, side to side. It was getting the exposures. They were, they had a handle on it. It's just kind of a cool capture, man. Two guys that yeah. hadn't probably seen each other in a while and just giving a fist bump. That was a, another one I got uh, um, on a, on a cover of a magazine. So I thought that was just kind of a cool, cool shot. It's a great, it's a great capture. It's a great, Hey, the silhouettes against the flame. It's just great composition, man. So it just, you know, I just wanted to, I don't know, since I do like the fire photography show show off just a, a little bit of stuff. Um I'll throw I'll throw one one or one or uh one or two more. How about um number three? Number three. Sam's killing it. <laughs> Go Sam. He's making up for lost time. He's the hero. This is a this is a rocking structure with some power lines in the foreground, a couple firefighters down. Yeah. Not down, but in the uh, in the yeah. In the yeah. I mean if is that if that's not the definition of fully involved, I don't know, I don't know what is, and that's from Flint, Michigan. Actually, um, went up there. Uh, and I'll give a shout out to my buddy uh, from Detroit, Steve Florian, uh, from Squad Three. He actually uh, went with me up there. We were I was hanging out with him and uh, at his house, and we went up there, man. And we went there for one night, and I think we went to like four fires. We just happened wow. to get lucky, man. Yeah. And, but, Talk about, you know, again, short staffed, you know, got three guys showing up on an engine with a commercial chassis. And that was the first time I ever saw somebody put a, uh, oh man, I just the, lost the name of it. The, a nozzle, the uh, the clamshell in between, like has an exposure protection. Um, yeah. somebody, out there, somebody out there knows the name of it. Man, I, Someone will throw it up here. Yep, yep, nah, man. I'm, I'm calling myself a fire buff and I can't even remember the, the name of it, but uh, it's not. Uh, anyway, 
But, you know, then they realize like those, those things don't work, right? Radiant heat goes right through water. You have to actually put water on the structure to protect it. So, but anyways, they, they did the best they could. They were short-sighted. This thing was going. They they actually went inside the house next door. I don't think it's in that photo. I have a couple other photos of the fire, but um, <laughs> those three guys. Water curtain, pulled, water curtain, people saying water curtain. Yes, water curtain. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, three guys stretching a the line. They went into that house next door, man. I mean, the 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 power pole was smoking. The power lines were smoking. The, the house next door was taken off and you know, they, they saved the, the one next door, but there was no, that was another one that collapsed, you know, from just right from going. So now I got a couple things to say on the people who said, uh, where is it at? Rob Fisher said, that's a can job. <laughs> no, he actually said two and a half, but yeah. I still wanted yeah. to say it that way. Uh, yeah. Jay, the seaside is searchable quoting Justin McWilliams. Hey, could, could be, I don't, I didn't get right. it's a, it's I a didn't, snapshot in time. That's what your whole I, point. I didn't make it to the seaside on that right. one, so, but it that, is a snapshot in time. That, that fire building did end up collapsing. So, uh, you know, another one of those, uh, let's see, what's another one I'll throw. Uh, you, you kind of like that one earlier. So, uh, number seven, number seven. And, uh, you know what I failed to mention and I see, I knew it, man, because my brain was just like going, 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 um, a, another photo mentor of mine and he was on this trip dave dubowski oh, okay from, from st louis st area. louis yeah um, muddy river old, old school old school photographer man muddy he, river speaking he, of yeah he uh he he's he still prints photos and puts them in albums it, it's awesome great guy he's coming down here actually next week with his wife to disney and his family and i'm, I'm gonna go hang out with him but uh great great dude and, and just you know super fun we, we took actually it took a trip last year up to the new york new jersey and like supposed to be cold weather it was like 70 degrees and we 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 had nothing and then they had a cold snap like two days after we left and had like six fires right right yes but anyways so is it up anyways yeah, it's up. yeah no yeah. no absolutely yeah, so, hydrant, sorry so. i just got sidetracked i i, I didn't want to fail to mention you know dj stone said chocolate milk mm. yeah yeah right i mean <laughs> That that's the kind of stuff that Detroit deals with, man. Like you know, it's, it's just kind of like a think about a standpipe too, right? That water hasn't flowed through in in you know who knows how long, and you open that up and that and you know making sure you flush that thing or whatever you know. And McGrail talks all about that stuff with the the pipes and the corrosion and all right. that. So yeah, see, it kind of it kind of all does kind kind of tie in together. So Mike was right, become the ultimate firefighter just by buffing. So just by buffing, there you go. Learn a lot, but we we were on a a gar garage fire or something around the corner and that box came in and, and the companies were on the other fire. So they were coming from a distance. So we got there, you know, before first water and that, that, that driver, man, he was hustling and uh, he, it was cool. Cause he just came out and got that thing going before he even, you know, pulled the hose off the uh, front intake. So he knew, you know, obviously his experience there is like, all right, it's going to have to flow for a minute anyway. Right on. You know, they, they, they do everything. Dude, I oh. love the photos. Absolutely love the photos, man. And and 100%, take more pictures. Yeah, Can we I'm get the job with done? With one more, we'll, we'll end it with one more. Number okay. one. Because, Number one, numero uno. Because, because I'm, you know, a truck company guy and I like trucks, so. <laughs> no spoilers. We got a bucket in the foreground. We got some burning in the background. Uh, just a uh, <laughs> one we almost missed, too. I was with uh, actually with John Citrino on this one, and we were uh, – Headed back into the hotel, man, and he's like, "Hey, you got the, the your monitor and the radio, right?" And I don't think I had it on, and so I turned it on right that second, and then we heard him call for a second, a second alarm. So we turned around, and, you know, went right back to the car and made out this. There was a whole uh, like a row of stores, man. There was like through a liquor store and like two or three other stores attached to it. The whole thing going again, another building that, that an ordinary constructed building that, that we watched collapse, man. Right. So right. You know, that, that's just not stuff that people see every day, but, you know, we just talk about how important, and I think Bob talked about it in his, how important building construction is, right? But, if, right. If you, and I, it's, it's so hard to explain to the younger generation about how to take something apart if you don't know how it's put together, mm. you know, like the skeleton of the building. And I, I tell you what, man, talk about Andrew Bassard, man, that guy's got some, like, I don't want to call them life size models, but smaller models of, of built out of wood of frame houses and stuff, and just you know balloon frame and, and to how you teach building instruction. It's amazing, you know the stuff. I used to, I still probably do, is go around and and uh, take pictures of just weird stuff that you see, you know, building instruction wise, and 
Uh, one of these days I'll get get it all organized. I don't know how many tens of thousands of pictures I have that I have to catalog and put into a to order. But anyways. right on, beautiful brother, absolutely beautiful. Uh, thank you for uh, taking us down the uh, the buff picture lane too. Now, I don't do a lot of visual stuff in the scrap because, of course, the majority of the listens come from audio only. And people listen to it on Spotify and Apple and iTunes. But you got to use your imagination and, and enjoy us talking about it there at the end. So thank you for well, sharing that I, with us. I, I tell you what, if you want to see him, go to Fire Department Shutterbug on Instagram. That's F I R E D E P T Shutterbug. Right on. And give me a follow. I post, uh, you know, about not 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 often, but once not once a month. I don't I don't have a lot of time, man. And 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 because uh, we really didn't get to the. Uh, the, this I don't know if we talked enough about fire, but we haven't talked about family yet, and that's like another thing I'm super passionate about. Right. My family, my kids, um, they're five and seven right now, and they're growing too fast. And you know, I, I kind of talked about it with 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 uh, you know, when, when Matt died and how, how it kind of changed my perspective about things. Like I said, I still love the job. I'm still 100, percent but uh, <clears throat> my my daughter was born in in, in 2015, and uh, Matt is her godfather, and uh, you know that that changed my perspective on the job absolutely. too. absolutely i can and, only imagine brother i can only imagine i still try to give you know 110 percent when i'm there i don't travel as much and take photos as much as i used to because you know i, I love, love 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 spending time with my kids and it's just it cracks me up you know everybody talks about their kids all the time and, and how great they are and, and you know we're all partial to our own kids right but sure. man you know, I'm like, you know, some guys like, oh, you got kids. Yeah, I got kids. You know, like, so I just, I can't, you know, you can't get enough, man. It, it, it just, they grow up so fast and, and they're just at an amazing age right now. So I, I love it, but you know, you got to do the right thing in the fire service for them too. Right. You know, because you want to come home to them every day. I love it. Get off work. And dude, you know. Fisher said, who wants to get together for a buff trip? I'm in Rob. Just let me know when. I'm in. I'll speak for JJ. We just got to plan it. Listen, I, they, they call me like the lead instructor for Bowling Green. I just call myself like the lead pay, paperwork generator. I'm the organizer. I'll organize it. You guys get together. I'll, I'll get it set up. We'll, we'll do, we'll do something sometime down the road for sure. Mike's Mike's chiming in. Hey, central Queens, 1075, another e-bike. <laughs> okay. Monitoring. Yeah. So, oh man, I, I just, uh, it was one other thing I was going to talk about. Go. Uh, just, um, and I think we kind of skipped over it, but just because it, it's really affects like my area, but like the, you know, it's not the modern fire ground, it's just new stuff, but modern construction in the homes, like how they're so much bigger, so much smaller lots, so much closer together, the new technology with, uh, uh, solar, panels, yeah, solar, yeah. solar panels. And it has reminded me that about the e-bike, you know, and then, then the, the e-bikes and all those things in people's garages, man, it's, that's a whole new set of challenges that right. we have to, like look for right like all the teslas the, the electric cars now you know people would how many different times have you heard oh man we used five thousand gallons of water or we buried it in a pool or we dug a pit and put the car in right it, you know to go out like that one um there was one back in march like a fifth alarm in the bronx they had the uh camera from inside it was an e-bike in a storm of a, a grocery store then a thermal runaway when that thing took off man there was no stopping it Right. Like, you know, and it turns into a fifth alarm in a row of taxpayers, you know, from 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 one little battery in, in an electric scooter. It's crazy. And they, I mean, they probably had two or three today, I think. No, the the, the e-bike crisis is insane, especially there in New York where people right. are looking right. for alternative forms of mode well, transportation. Yeah. yeah. All, all the the, you know, the cheap batteries or whatever. Right. No, yeah. it's insane. It's insane. Uh, the, yeah. The thermal runaway, especially. Beautiful, my brother. All right. Man, you crushed it so far. So we have a thing we do on the weekly scrap. It's called the five questions for firefighters. Of course, we asked it 120 times in a row, then we switched it up. So now it's the next five questions for firefighters. So my question to you, JJ, is are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? I'm ready. The answers are completely arbitrary. They're your opinion only. There is no right or wrong, technically. There is no right or wrong. And the points are arbitrary and they're completely assigned by me with the help of the audience. So here we go. Number one, what single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top tier go-to 
badass firefighter? I think part of it is love for the job. Because if you love the job, you're going to do good at it. You're going to be great at it. You're just going to, um, like, I don't, like, I tell guys this all the time, I don't expect you to immerse yourself in the job like I do or I did. And again, you know, I, I have that work-life balance, right? You you have to, but you also have to understand that you have to make yourself better every day. You have to be learning something every day you go to where I, I mean, like I said, I'm not the same company officer I was 10 years ago. I've learned a lot of lessons, you know, and, and I still am learning, you know, and I hope to go to work tomorrow and, and, and figure something out, learn something new, you know, going and looking at a new 3000 square foot home. That's six feet away from the house next to it and go, what are we going to do here? If we pull up, you know, alone for the first five minutes, you know, what if there's an e-bike in this garage, you know, or whatever. So, you know, I just think love for the job, man. Cause if you have love for the job, I think you're going to want to do, do a good job. Beautiful. Beautiful. Everybody said, we lost the stream for a second. It locked up. It locked up. It's back and working. It appears like it's working for everybody. Let me know if it's not. Yeah. Facebook is definitely struggling to keep up. I love the answer. Thank you. Max points. I'm telling you straight up. Number two, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, what would it be? <clears throat> So I think I'm going to go opposite of what like most people would say is I would ask more questions. I was always kind of a reserved, quiet kind of guy, but I wish I had picked the brain of guys that were on the job, like in the seventies, you know, when I first started out that just had, you know, that experience of, of doing things kind of like the old school way a little bit, um, you know, if you're asking questions and trying to learn about the job, I don't think that's the same as, as being the rookie that come in and doesn't shut your mouth you know, but ask the questions and listen, listen to what they have to say. But, but certainly, you know, if I had just, you know, like I said, you know, they're, they're, those guys were mentors to me too, because they, they taught me so much that I thought I knew when I came out of the fire academy, I didn't know, but yeah, yeah, you got to ask questions, right. To learn. So I would, I would have asked more questions and not just, you know, I love, I love the answer because I remember, I remember being a 20 year old kid getting on the job and seeing those guys that had been hired on in the 75, 76. And I did not appreciate everything they'd been through and everything they'd learned, you know, and they stayed another 15 years and eventually I did, but you know, it, it's crazy. Uh, the, inex I don't want to say the inexperience, but the youth, the youth that doesn't appreciate the wisdom, you know what I'm saying? Right. And I, yeah, I love the answer, brother. Max points on number two. Uh, number three, what is your favorite training drill? <clears throat> wow. Man, I, like as a, as a company officer, I, I always just, when, when, when guys pull the rig out in front of the station and, and set the truck up, we're doing it like the same every time. Like I would just go out and pick maybe like we were like on, on a run in an apartment complex or something. And just, especially the the guys that were like trying to get the relief driver, have them just set up the rig somewhere where we just pulled up or like, Hey, you know, pull over here. There's a fire in this building right here. Let's, let's set the rig up. Just like that kind of not prep for a drill type thing, you know, like, or not like, okay, guys, we're going to go out and, and do this. And some of who would do that too, but I just think like that, that kind of off the cuff stuff with like setting up the rig was super important. And I, I love forcible entry. So, and who doesn't like breaking stuff? So I love, I love doing, doing forcible entry stuff. So forcible entry or off the wall, setting up the apparatus. I'm trying to not off, not off the wall, kind of off the cuff, but off the cuff. yeah, fair enough, I, fair enough. It's, it's, it's like a 50, 50 thing. It could be off the wall, right? It could be something. Okay. Off the wall. okay. But, no, I like, I like the answer. I like the answer. Uh, 100%. I can't, it's like, I don't have a favorite. Who's, I don't have a favorite kid. I like them both equally. Fair enough. I, both, I, it's say. your answer. Number four. What did, I get max, did I get max points or no? Negative. Negative. Uh, if you get max <laughs> points, you get max points. But you gave me two answers. So uh, what mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? <clears throat> I, I would have to say kind of, I kind of referenced it earlier, man, is like calling somebody out in, in front of people, you know, mm. and, and Again, it wasn't done intentionally, but I own it. You know, I did it. 
I made a mistake. I apologize. Me and the guy are like perfectly okay now. Um, you know, it, it was it was not meant to be like a stump to chump thing, and it just happened. So if if you're gonna, you know, have a conversation like if if somebody's coming over to your rig that's not normally there, and you you have questions about their abilities or whatever, I would make sure that they came into the office and we had that conversation one on one instead of in front of other people because you just n- never know what's going to happen. Right. No, rather, and, and that's so tough. Uh, it's like, it, it was a leadership lesson, you know, right. as, as a company officer lesson. And you know what? I don't, I don't apologize. Cause I, I got a, a rap for, you know, I had a 19 year old kid when I first got promoted to Lieutenant as my fireman, his dad was on the job. He got hired. He'd been there two months when I, when I came there as a Lieutenant, he'd been two months on the job. That was it. And Sunday was my first day. St. Patrick's Day it was March 17th. I'll never forget. And Sunday's our rig day. And I was out there with this kid all day going over, like literally we took the nozzles off the hose and we're and it, like the nozzle was just happened to be like all dirty from the road grime and everything. And we were washing the rig. And so I was like, Hey man, let's just, you know, throw this in the mop bucket and water and wash it off. And like, you wouldn't believe like how that story just turned like, oh man, he had the kids scrubbing nozzles and, you know, like, <laughs> there was just, you know, but it was just taking pride in our equipment. Right. And right. Right. About that. Like, Hey man, we're cleaning tools. You know, we, we come back, we don't like leave rust all over the hooks and the halligans, but why would you want, you know, road grease and grime in your, in your ball of your nozzle that's not going to open, you know, or whatever, like beautiful. So max points on number four. And final question. I already know the answer. I really feel like I know the answer just because I know you. But I have to ask the question. There's heavy fire. There is searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? Yeah, I don't like nozzles that much. So <laughs> there's no, there's no, no, no question about it. First in VES. You did not disappoint. And I knew that was coming. I, I but, can't tell you a curveball. I had at least get four out of five, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, it probably would have been max points hundred percent. All you had to do is pick one. Uh, then I could say max points, but, yeah. but you did, you did have the, I can't pick a favorite kid and I can't argue with that, but <laughs> 100%. There you go. The five questions, the next five questions for firefighters, according to JJ Cassetta, that officially puts 195 scraps in the books. And we've gone like two hours and like 15 minutes now. Can I, uh, can I say which, one more thing? Yeah, you can say as much as you want, brother. I'm not on a time frame. Well, normally you ask, don't you normally ask a question about a book? I do. Right between, right between. Well, we did the pictures in between, so it kind of, I, I kind of skipped the books. But I will go books 100. percent Okay. I didn't mean to leave you out. That's all right. No, 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 no. It's cool. I, I just because I, I feel you know so passionately about about the, uh, the truck stuff. But uh, Mike Champo's book. Mm. Power Ladders, Tactics, Tips, and Tales is out there, and it's a phenomenal book. And I don't, I know, I, I had a, I feel special because he let me, you know, add a a little nugget to the book. Very nice. I just, I just gave him a few little things, and it's on um, amusement parks, the part of it. And it's not about me. I'm not saying that, but it's, it's a phenomenal book by a phenomenal guy, and I, I would recommend, highly recommend that book. Hundred percent. And, I pre-ordered and, it. I pre-ordered it. I got my copy in, and then it was promptly stolen by the driver at my station, and I haven't seen it since. Okay. <laughs> so I really, I haven't even got to read it other than ordering it. So yeah. And, and I'm thankful that he let let uh, my kids play a small part in uh, announcing his book at the uh, Water on the Fire last year. Awesome. Um, they brought it to him. That was the first copy. And I was going to say one other book, and it's called Firehouse by, uh, it's a photography book by uh, Jill Friedman. Uh, with Dennis Smith. And uh, I was gonna say the reason I like that book is because it's mostly pictures. And you know, I'm not that good at reading. So that was another one, another one of my, my uh, dry humor jokes. Sometimes I don't get it when you're joking. <laughs> I love it, brother. <laughs> so that officially makes it 195 scraps in the book. JJ said, what an amazing evening. If someone wants to get a hold of you, what is the best way to do so? All right. You ready for this? Jay Cassetta, so it's my first initial last name, C-A-S-S-E-T-T-A, at AOL.com. <laughs> I love it. 
Uh, I, think, like I, to... think, I think I'm one of seven people that still have an AOL. Still account. have it, yeah. Maybe that's why we were having like so many problems in the beginning with it because I was like, you know, that there's a dial up. Dry, bam, 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 bam. Yeah, I know the sounds. Yeah, that I can't do it, but I can picture it in my head that what it should sound like. But uh, yeah, Rob Fisher said AOL question mark. Yes, that's right. That's why I, I got to say it twice at AOL.com. <laughs> so many, there's so many people typing AOL in here right now with the <laughs> wide eyed emojis. Yeah, right. Uh, perfect. Uh, that's it, man. Uh, everybody in the audience, go to firehousevigilance.com. The vigilantes, go join. Five bucks a month. You can sign up for a year if you want. Uh, you have vigilante meetups that you can be a part of. It's it's a phenomenal time. Attend conferences, join up. That is just another thing coming up. Uh, Rob Fisher, who's in here tonight, next Sunday, he's doing a breakdown of the wall bombs fire. We're going to talk about it. If you want to be a part of it, Become a member of the Vigilantes. Get in on the exclusive content and the exclusive stuff. The badass scraps continue. Next week, Mike Salzano. We're staying in Florida. What an amazing person. I look forward to that scrap. And then following that, first time ever, who, who should have been on here forever ago, Anthony Avillo. How awesome is that going to be? Uh, it's looking spicy. Not to mention 200 is fast. We're at 195. 200 is fast approaching. Kurt Isaacson has... Uh, yeah, he's gonna be Kurt, so it's gonna be it's, <laughs> it's like a tiger by the tail. I, I yeah, I think you said it one time. Like no one has the passion like he does. I feel like I have like the passion inside, but I can't like I just can't let express it out. No, it. Yeah, no, no one, one can, can express yeah. it like he can, right? So like unleashed thunderstorm. Awesome. And uh, Mike Salzano, good dude down in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale. Um, you know, you know, just real quick to to wrap it up with about you know Matt. Uh, when we started, I kind of feel like we were like one of the original fire conferences, the Orlando fire conference in the early, you know, 2000s before social media. I mean, Matt and I were driving around handing out flyers to fire departments around here to, to advertise for that thing in the early years, nice. uh, you know, about 10 or 12 years ago, they, they were like, Hey man, we want, we want to start up our own, our own fire conference. And Matt was just like, man, whatever we can do to help, man, it's all about training firefighters. So they, they put on a great conference. I've been down there too. And uh, so Mike, Mike will be a, a great dude too next time. Looking forward to it, man. I really, dude, I'm the lucky, I tell this to everybody. I'm the luckiest dude in the fire service because I get to have conversations with you like this, with the people that are in here making comments. It's, it's surreal and it's awesome. It's humbling and I'm proud of it all at the same time. It's such a weird mixture. Uh, so yeah. yeah. Just well, I, appreciate, I appreciate you having me, man. I, I, I enjoyed it. I hope, I hope whoever listened got something out of it. I don't know oh, if dude. I did. Kind of phenomenal rambled. phenomenal but, guest phenomenal scrap thank you you brought value to the american fire service today along with the the audience um thank you for being a phenomenal guest audience you make the scrap magical i mean that from the bottom of my heart thank you for being here tuning in live uh and asking the questions making the comments it's what makes it great remember mutts don't scrap i hope the tone stays silent unless it's burning everybody stay safe out there <laughs>